Hey y'all, I'm Kelly Moody and you're listening to the Ground Shots Podcast, an audio project exploring our relationship to ecology through conversations and storytelling with farmers, herbalists, craftspeople, naturalists, artists, and more. Hey y'all, welcome to episode 12 of the Ground Shots Podcast. I'm currently recording this in my friend's home on the South Fork of the Trinity River, a place I've mentioned a few times in the last couple episodes. Everyone's out right now, so I have a quiet moment to record this. It's been raining like crazy, and it's amazing. The atmospheric river is here. The South Fork is totally swollen and creeping up to the shores of my friend's land right now, and it's funny, in the last episode with Wonia, in the beginning of our conversation, which we did on this river, I was listening to it once I released it last week, and we were commenting on how low the river was. <laughs> that was uh, early January, and now it is late February uh, 2019, and it is pretty different, and it's great. The land needs it, and it's exciting to see what the water is doing. This episode with Turtle is on mead making, and I would call it probably a more intermediate mead making. I say that because we get kind of into a lot of details about fermenting and making meads beyond the surface level. It gets a bit more philosophical, which I'm really into, as it has me thinking about a lot of things in regards to fermenting and transformation and alchemy and the human relationship to altered states of consciousness. Something I thought about a lot uh, since my teen years, and I don't speak about it a lot publicly, because often I'm just formulating what I feel and think about it all. But when I was in college, I have a degree in philosophy and religion, and that was a huge part of my thinking and research during that time, my early 20s, both on globalism, our relationship to plants, especially entheogenic plants, um, and the, especially the relationship between what we call Western cultures and non-Western cultures and entheogenic plants, which is something I sometimes don't see talked about enough even now, and it's been over 10 years since I wrote papers on that. And, you know, I've been reading through Michael Pollan's book on psychedelics, actually, recently, and, I mean, I haven't gotten too far yet, so I don't want to say anything about it yet. But um, it's pretty, it's a pretty mainstream book now. So I think that's relevant to this conversation with Turtle on mead making because we mention kind of that edge that we're touching on as humans in this modern culture when we choose to do things like make, making our own ferments and specifically meads and how powerful that is and how sometimes that almost feels a little heretical, as we mentioned in this interview. I want to just mention a few things that I don't mention too much on the podcast that I just feel like I'd like to this time. I release newsletters every now and then through email, and I have been starting to include suggestions for books, articles, and other podcast episodes that I really like and inspire my thinking about the intersections of art, ecology, environmental ethics, activism, philosophy, just like all of these things that for me spider web around each other and relate and kind of feed into each other. You know, a lot of people send out newsletters and I do mention like things that I've been up to and, you know, the latest podcast episodes and other things, but for myself even putting together kind of a collection of things that I feel like are worth looking into is pretty helpful and fun. So if you want to receive a newsletter from me every now and then, sometimes it's every month or every other month, it just depends on how able I am to put one together in the place where I am. You can sign up in the show notes, I believe I have it there, or you can go on my website 
at ofsedgeandsalt.com and you can sign up there. Another aspect of the Ground Shots project, one of the things that I do is put together extensive ethnobotanical plant profiles that are heavily influenced by my observations and learning that I've done while traveling and spending time with the plants in wild places as well as extensive research I do in books and libraries. I can get really into the details and I like kind of going down that rabbit hole every now and then. It's definitely, it takes a lot out of me when I sit down and really um, focus on these research projects and they often take me way longer than I think I'm going to take. But I also like to look at the big picture so I try to put both of those together in these profiles and I've written about things like cottonwood but not just cottonwood buds are for this medicinal purpose. I also talk about how there are lots of species of cottonwood and here's how they act in different places and here's how we should see them in deep time and here's their human relationship and here's how it all fits into an ecology on the big picture and across the landscape. And I enjoy thinking about plants and plant medicine and human relationships to plants in that way. So if you would like to read them, they are free on my blog. I'm always sort of altering them, putting more pictures in them. So if you've read them previously, go back and take a look again. I might have updated it. Also wanted to note that all... I'd say about 95% of the photography on my website is my own. Uh, when you go on there and you see all the plant photos, that's all me. And if it was someone else, I note it. To give you a little overview of what we talk about in this several hour conversation, so sit back and relax. Uh, we talk about how to make meads, first and foremost. We talk about details on primary and secondary fermentation what that means. We talk about mead circles, the alchemy of mead making, changing culture through fermentation, a few herbs for mead making, making meads on special dates, mead making culture in western North Carolina, mead and beer fermentation history, the influence of the church in quotation marks on beer and its ingredients, the connection between fermentation and earth-based spirituality, making mead with scotch broom and other edgy plants, and the relationship between being human and fermenting foods and drinks, alcohol consumption and the poison path, and how Frank Cook may have influenced the creation of this podcast. <laughs> and there's a bunch more we talk about, but I will leave it at that. So Enjoy listening to this, y'all. I've been making mead for, um, geez, I think 14 years now. And it's been something that I've just make sure that I brew anywhere between five and 15 batches a year, depending mm -hmm. on the year and availability of my own time and focus and resources. It's a relatively easy project, but you just need to, you know, make sure you're involved in it totally as it goes on. So there's been a large body of, um, work, if you will, mm -hmm. from an artistic languaging. Um, I've probably made over a hundred different meads in the past 14 years. Yeah, we didn't let on to it too much in the interview about the California Trail because we wanted to kind of focus on that walk, but you did mention a little bit in that that Frank Cook kind of inspired you to follow that a little more, you know, follow the yeah, path Frank of was, Frank was certainly the impetus for for me, um, in the mead making thing, I was living in Asheville, North Carolina at the time, and he was coming through on a regular basis, um, teaching classes on mead making and fermentation. This is a little bit before the big wave of fermentation, you know, took the nation in via like a mainstream way that it has. Yeah. yeah, or even in the alternative, and also the mainstream. But there was, you know, somewhere around. I don't know, 2000 and, um, 
seven or eight or nine that things really picked up in terms of people making fermented products like sauerkraut or kimchi or kombucha, um, kombucha mead, obviously, um, were some of the, the main staples of the movement, if I could call it that. Sandor Katz's book, Wild Fermentation, and then later The Art of Fermentation, were, I feel like, the more... Um, part, part, kind of catalyst. The catalysts, that. exactly, of that movement and um frank's thing was a little more underground there was like you know 10 or 15 people per class when he would teach mead making and um i due to my where i was living and what i was into um was introduced as he introduced me to mead making and then took me up as his assistant and and co-teacher um pretty quickly because i i just got really into it and he recognized um that I that I had a, a a particular panache for my style for how I did it and so then he and I started co-teaching and that was a big part of f for me what pushed me deeper into the craft if you will mm -hmm. of mead making before we go any further shall we pour ourselves a little mead sure let's try something um well so far we've already drank a little bit of ginger mead that someone else made that I contributed, right? That was mm -hmm. pretty different, you said, than what you usually make is ginger mead. Yeah, just in styles. I feel like everybody has a different... Um, uh, they could, People can use the same exact ingredients, but for whatever reason, the spirit of the, of the brewer and the spirit of the occasion and the place um, seems to uh, uh, change the outcome of what the particular flavor or something like that is. Um, this first thing I'm going to pour is uh, a unique mead in that it um, was made from a bunch of juices that someone donated. They had all this black currant mulberry and then a mix of three different types of varietal grapes, a Merlot, a Syrah, and um, I think a Pinot. And that was a like a grape juice concentrate. It was free, and so I just added honey to it and then pitched yeast on it and fermented it. So it's a cool example of how you can take something that is just, say, juices that have a bunch of sugars in them and then add natural sugars, that is, um, fruit sugars, not white sugar, but then add honey to that and come up with something that would be considered a mead of sorts. But you maybe used less honey than you would have. I, I used less honey than I would have because there was natural um, yeah. sugars already going. So let's just pour a little bit. This is a very dark color. It almost looks like a wine, like a Pinot. Yeah, totally. Um, Pinot Noir, that is. And it has a slightly sweet flavor compared to a lot of what I normally make. I typically end up with a drier mead. Um, that, for your listeners, is, you know, there's a whole spectrum you could go out and you can order meat at an Ethiopian restaurant, let's say, and you can have their traditional tej. And that's going to typically be a sweeter meat. So for a lot of people that are listening that have tried meat but maybe didn't like it, it could be that it was too sweet. It could be that it was too dry. Just keep trying different flavors because there's a lot of different things that are out there. And now with commercial meads coming out more and more, um, we're really being subjected to a particular brewer's taste or what they're trying to create. I find commercial mead tends to be more sweet. And I think um, that typically that's because they know that uh, the connoisseur, the person who's going to buy it in the store, doesn't necessarily know what mead is. And they think, oh, honey and wine, two of my favorite things. Put them together. I love it. And so they're going to want it to taste like honey. And so a lot of the meads that you buy off the shelf um, at least in the past 10 years. Now we're coming into a craft industry where people are um, feeling like marketing something that's a little more risky, if you will, and they're targeting a, a particular flavor that's different, a market that's different than 10 years ago. Mead was typically sweet, a sweet mead. Syrupy. It was more of a dessert thing. Do you feel like there's a cultural aspect to it too in the U.S. of like whatever we think mead was like 
where I mean I don't know like I think I remember the first couple of times I tried mead where it was like at pagan festivals and people were like this mm. is what the Vikings drink and then there's like this certain relationship with like our earthy roots of like this is the kind of mead that we drink but it also might be this fantasy that we think it's you know yes one. mead definitely in my I say definitely but I I feel that it I I feel pretty confident that mead was coming out. At 10 years ago, it was coming out of the Renaissance Festival culture. And there was people that were into mead making, you know, in other words, craft brewers, people that did it in their, their home, home brewers, if you will, tended more toward this Renaissance fair type of personalities. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, I think we're seeing a lot more variation in it. And I would... Um, speak for myself and saying like what my trajectory in the mead making was because it was connected to Frank Cook, it really had to do with herbalism. As herbalists, we were going through the forest, we were wild crafting, we were going on plant walks, we were doing these different things where we're being introduced to different plants that had wild plants that had medicinal qualities. And we were recognizing that the mead making was a great way to preserve the medicinal values of those plants. And so in other words, we were saying to ourselves, oh, look, here is this um, skull cap or this mugwort or this smilax or something that was a, a native plant that had a spectrum in the season where it was at its peak medicinal value. And we were asking ourselves, how can I capture that? One way would be to tincture it. And another way would be to... Um, process it, boil it, and make um, a mead from that through the fermentation of yeast. So people make honey infusions too, but basically this is taking it a step further from like a a honey infusion or syrup. You take this syrup and then add yeast to it, and then suddenly it maybe lasts longer than syrup would. Right, through the fermentation. Longer than syrup, maybe not as long as a tincture, but it's kind of similar to a tincture at that point in, in the context that it has a... A certain shelf life, but as t- long as it's bottled, corked. Tincturing is not necessarily a historic way to preserve venison, as much as mead would be. Right, and that was for me anyway the fascination. I felt like I was kind of in this traditional way, um, honoring thousands of years of of people's uh, f- familial ways of you know each family or something would have a recipe, or at least that was my sort of fantasy. There's a great book by Stephen Herod Buner called uh, Make, uh, Brewing Sacred and Herbal Healing Beers. And in that book, he covers a lot of the medicinal uses historically of the herbs and the plants and things like that. And so in, in many ways, our little movement um, with around mead making that for me and for a lot of my peers started in Asheville, North Carolina as a way of harvesting, collecting the vast amount of medicinal plants that were growing in that area and then preserving them using honey and fermentation. So you feel like between Frank Cook and Sandra Katz, those people kind of headlined that? Or do you feel like it was an organic, collaborative, like community-wide process? I would say the latter. You know, I think it's easy um, and appropriate almost to to pitch um, Frank Cook and Sandra Katz as the... Um, the impetus behind that, and certainly they were the teachers, but it was kind of this perfect storm in the context that you you had these two great teachers that were so capable of inspiring many, many people um, upon the road of the green path, if you will, the journey into uh, plant-based medicines and, and things. And then you had this anomaly, I call it, because... There was a man by the name of um, Greg, I'm drawing a blank on the last name. He was the honey guy. He was the Hall Creek honey guy. Greg Rogers, is it? I don't remember his name, but I bought plenty of gallons of honey. Plenty of gallons of honey. (laughs) This guy had a a 24-hour self-serve honey stand. He didn't charge enough. And he was, at the time that we were getting involved, it was... I remember when it was twelve dollars a gallon, but then it was eighteen dollars oh a God. gallon. Now it's you know well no, over 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 
there was this perfect situation in which at any time of the day you could access a gallon of honey. And so often with my friends, it could be a Friday night and, and well, what are you doing? I don't know. There's nothing to do. Let's, well, let's brew mead. Okay, I'll swing by Greg's place and pick up a gallon of honey at 9.30 at night and then we were off and running. And so I, I think that the one reason why the mead movement calls Asheville its ground zero is because we had easy access to affordable honey. And um, that's not something that I've seen everywhere. And so we were able to go through a trial and error process. You know, like not every batch that we made was that great. We learned the hard way that certain herbs when used too much, be it mugwort, whorehound, or cloves, uh. <laughs> can really tank a five gallon batch of mead. And, and when you've spent a lot of money to produce that, that's a, that's a real kind of kick in the ass, you know? But we were at that time, 2004, um, we had direct access to affordable honey. And so we were able to really play with all of these different variables and kind of find our way, if you will, to, um, to being really proficient at pulling off good mead in the long mm -hmm. run. I think we did anyway. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this? This is, uh, it's, it's sweet. It's, um, it's sweet, but it's not as sweet as other meads I've had. Mm -hmm. during my renaissance fair pagan festival days but well let's try this one um this one here is a mead that for me is a regular every year on february 13th i brew um a mead that is kind of my beginning of the season if you will i mm -hmm. usually don't brew through the winter very much um just regarding temperatures mainly um mm -hmm. the the mead needs to sit at a certain temperature to kind of pull it off and so i like to um brew a lot in the late of um season in other words i'm Fall. kind of backing up and i'm saying like in autumn i make a lot of mead i get as many of the carboys the the fermenting vessels that i have i get them all full with whatever harvestable material which that time of year is a perfect time to go out and collect whatever's left in terms of fruits or herbs and they get all that stuff fermenting and then that goes through the winter and then so it starts off warmer and then ends on a cooler note because yeah are you usually fermenting things in a setting where it's not as climate controlled or like semi climate controlled yeah you know it's in my house or something like that but i don't want to keep my my home at 70 degrees you know 80 degrees all winter like the primary fermentation wants to take place in a warmer time of year and so it's really kind of nice to not too hot. start off with a nice warmer period through october november and then just let them in the secondary fermentation be at a cooler temperature they don't mind that so much but the warmer period in this area which is the sierra foothills of california it's pretty it stays like it can be in the 70s in November. Right. You know, but if it was Appalachia, it would be a little bit colder. Yeah, this is all variable different. to the different places. And yeah. I've brewed extensively in North Carolina. I've brewed extensively out here in Northern for California. This place, the fall is the best time. Well, I mean, for both of them, really. It just, you know, again, it's about keeping them in a, in, in a part of your house that maintains that appropriate temperature. Mm -hmm. And so my point is, is I don't generally start a lot of meads in the dead of winter. Mm -hmm. Just as a habit, I guess. But typically, February 13th is the beginning of that, um, my first meads of the year. Why the 13th? So the 13th, it's in bulk. In no, bulk. It's, it's not bulk. in that if you were to go from a sort of um, traditional calendar, or I guess that would be like the pagan calendar or whatever they call themselves. But then this um, is interestingly associated with the Grateful Dead of which mm -hmm. I happen to be a fan. <laughs> and any of our listeners out there uh, that are into the Grateful Dead may recognize that on February 13th of 1970, the Grateful Dead played a particularly beautiful Dark Star, which is a song uh, for those of you that aren't 
readily familiar with the Grateful Dead if you get a chance. I'm sure you can Google it and find said song and listen to it and enjoy it. Anyhow, I put that song on and I and while I'm brewing and it creates a, a bit of an atmosphere and uh, I just really enjoy the the sense that that I'm infusing this music into this particular brew. Now the ingredients change from year to year, but the steady kind of uh, regular ingredients for this mead are ginger, cinnamon, cardamom, black tea, rose. Vanilla may or may not take a, a, a role in that. Often it does. Um, and then often some other things. Maybe I'll put a little Damiana in that mm -hmm. or something. So it's, it's a little bit of like a chai flavor, if you will. But um, with those staple ingredients, and then I kind of rotate a couple other things, depending on what's in my personal apothecary or something I feel called to. But I, I tend to try to balance all of those different things. So we can give this one a, a little sip. So you make that combination or something similar to that every year around at that date? Yes. And it, you find that it turns out pretty different every time or similar or... I feel similar enough because of the ginger, cardamom, and cinnamon context. And I'll use cumin. I think this one has a little cumin in it. I was immediately like, there's something else. Yeah. Cumin, folks. Who would have thought that cumin <laughs> would be um, an ingredient in a mead? But it actually it provides a really interesting balance. Well, think of this as like a digested pre... We haven't had dinner yet. We're going to take a break somewhere in this podcast and eat dinner. But to think of like pre-digestive having a drink before you have dinner with cumin in it mm -hmm. makes sense it balances nicely with the rose mm -hmm. um black pepper is something that i've used in this particular um flavor before so i guess what i'm pointing out to um our listeners is this idea of having a staple mead that is that from year to year you brew like whether it's your birthday or whether it's some significant um date for me it happens to be you know a grateful dead song and but i like the idea that that we can orbit our creative process around certain bookmarks if you will throughout the year and so there's a few others that i touch on and we'll maybe even get a chance to taste some of those as this interview goes on but I feel like it really has to do with um, taking this concept of, of, of meat as medicine, which is how when I teach classes on meat making, I, I book it as meat as medicine. But there's a lot of um, other layers to what medicine is. And so time and space, that's also something that can be reeled into our creative process and honored time and space in other words every one of these was created on the same date mm -hmm. throughout the years and i've been making the the 213 mead since uh, i think early 2000s well, 2007 maybe and and but that um that the the location often changes I'm in a different but the date place. Might stay the same. But the date per se is there's something special about that, especially in a culture where we are trying to figure out how to create our own culture. And of course I've heard this said about mean making is that it is a way of creating culture. You know, culturing is a way of creating culture. And fermenting is culturing. I've sat in on enough mead circles at this point to see sort of the way that people play with dates and numbers and combinations of things and events and the times of the year and celebrate that by making a mead and then holding on to it and saving mm -hmm. it for like special occasions pulling it out like I remember being at one in North Carolina maybe at Firefly Gathering or another one of the gatherings where there tends to be a mead circle every time and someone's like this is from 12 12 12 and this is from 10 10 10 and this is from you know um this specific 
Beltane or whatever, you know, and of this year when this sp- storm happened. And I held on to it because I felt like I wanted to wait until I wanted to... I wanted to share this with my community to, to help everyone remember that the storm happened at this time, you know. And I was just... I had never encountered anything like that before. <laughs> so I coined a phrase for that. I call yeah. them uh, sacromels. In other words, for our listeners, I'll, I'll say a list of each mead. Um, and, uh, uh, different flavors of meads have different names, right? So mead technically is just honey and water. Anything that includes other ingredients mm, technically to who's counting is not a mead. If you have herbs, it's called a methaglin. Mm-hmm. If it's honey, water, and herbs, it's a methaglin. If it's honey, water, and um, roots, it's a rhizomel. If it's honey, water, and roses, it's a rhodomel, coming from the Latin name for the rose. Um, there's a sizer is apples. apples and honey and water. A pear mead would be a pizer. There are different names for whether or not you have mulberries. I think that's called a borat. Um, honey and water and barley is a braggot. So there's all these different names. A lot of them in, in mel because mel is um, Spanish or Latin or French for, for honey. So um, a rhizomel, roots, rhizo, rhizome, mel, honey, is a root mead. So a ginger mead would technically be called a rhizomel. So for me, a sacromel would be when you're taking this concept of a sacrament or a sacred day or occasion and mixing that with honey and creating a mead. So I think... For me, I tend to um, make a lot of sacromels because I'm either brewing with friends because they're in town visiting and we say, well, let's make a mead. And so then we end up making this very festive mead that I'm tempted to only drink or share when they're in town or someone that knows them is in town. And then we have this kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, good old Mark Williams, you know, good old Frank Cook, like good old... Mateo, these people who are part of my community of brewers and mead makers. Now, the other would be the dates, like on this 213, February 13th, the brewing of that, or on my birthday, um, which we're going to sample a, a 919 mead, I September 19th. My, my grandpa's 90th birthday. Sacramento. At, at the party, because we had the party at my parents' farm. It was in September, and there was a bunch of things blossoming at the time muscadine grapes Mm -hmm. and i put a bunch of sage and different things in the herb garden in there and i was like okay everyone's coming over for my grandpa's 90th birthday people are traveling from hours away i'm hanging out all day at the farm before everyone gets there i'm just gonna make a mead to celebrate and i haven't opened any of them yet special and he's 95 now right (laughs) it's a little hard to do to open those when it's not somebody that you know, can relate to that particular sacrament. And so they end up being, um, for one, special, uh, but also for me, especially for the ones that I do on a yearly basis, um, sometimes those are the only means I make for that whole year. If I'm just really busy with everything else going on, I find that it, that suddenly I go, oh, next week is, 213 or my birthday or or the other ones that hold spaces on my calendars they end up being the things that guide me back to the stove that guide me back to the hive to collect on that guide me back to the spoon to stir they that bring me back to the the craft and so in that regard um the sacrament isn't just enjoyed in the drinking it's enjoyed in the actual brewing of it because I've turned other people onto some of those dates and they all show up <laughs> on that date to help with the brewing of it. And so I've actually inspired um, a lot of non deadheads to <laughs> enjoy the song Dark Star. And so it's a special thing. 
And yeah. so um, I'm glad that you enjoy this particular yeah, one. Yeah, that's good. Mm. It's interesting that it's something to do with the Grateful Dead and not like the pagan calendar. Because I mean, to me, Imbolc is, my birthday is February 4th, and Imbolc is basically like February 2nd, 3rd. And I'm always like, candle mass, in bulk mm-hmm. is like my time because I really see the difference in the light at that time more than the winter solstice, you know. And I'm like, this is my time. I made it through. I'm going to celebrate now after that date. Well, I encourage you to claim that little window as your special brewing moment. Mm-hmm. Your first meet of the year and hopefully 10 or 15 years from now, I'll be sitting in your wine cellar looking at all the different in bulk meads that you've made over the years because that became a real touchstone for you as far as a a, a, a thing to connect to yeah it's just now that I've been more nomadic rather than farming I found that it my mead making and fermenting has fallen to the wayside like I make kefir water and I make kombucha and meads and stuff when I was more land-based, or even seasonally land-based, like six months I'm here, even if the other six months I'm traveling, just how do I do that in my camper when I might be in like below freezing temps and then I might be in fine temps for mead? So I've kind of not done, I don't think I've made a mead in a, in a year and a half. Yeah, but before that I was doing a lot of either those sac what do you call it sacra sacramel sacramels or i'm also a big fan of like really simple meads because when i was farming i grew um a lot of medicinal herbs and then i would also incorporate wild plants so i made like a calamus lemongrass mead because i grew lemongrass and i had calamus in the creek and just calamus lemongrass simple or like just a peppermint mead you know just seeing what it would taste like with one or two ingredients. Mm-hmm. I'm really into that too. From Me that too. year. Me too. Rather than mm-hmm. like the hundred things that you could put into like a moment mead. You right. Know? It gets a little overwhelming in that. Yeah. There's 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 something cool about both of those. And it's good to try to do both of those. But it's been a while because I feel like I would love to make like a manzanita flower mead. Which is kind of a February, March mm-hmm. moment around here. But I haven't tried it yet. Well, in regards to that, I mean, just as input for you and your journey, I, th- I say brew it and they will come. The people that will take care of... Find a place to put it. Of your it. Needs. <laughs> yeah, you, because it, it takes time for it to ferment and go through its processes. And it's true that there's a lot of care that needs to be given to it in terms of, um, you know, for example, racking. Yeah. So maybe right now would be a good moment to explain the actual process of yeah, mead that making. Yeah, that would be great because we can get pretty geeky about this. Uh, we can get pretty that. geeky and we don't want to skip over for our listeners that are that feel inspired um, to go down the mead path. It's really an easy thing It's to, to, to make. It just requires a little bit of focus and time and space and things to make it happen. But ultimately you create a tea from the herbs Um, that you're working with and so if it's roots I tend to let them boil for about 45 minutes and then I cut that off and then if I have leaves or or berries or flowers or things that I want to just not boil but let them steep I add that to that and let that sit for a while and then in a separate pot I bring water to warm not quite boiling but just warm enough to melt honey and then I use the ratio of roughly four to one so that's easy to remember it's on your hand if you think about four fingers and a thumb so you have four units of water and one unit of honey so if that's gallons you have four gallons of water and one gallon of honey now that's the ratio i use some people go a little more a little less depending on what their particular uh, goal is or what have you but i go four to one And so I dissolve the honey into the water and then I combine the water and the honey and the herbs in their tea into, let's say, a five-gallon carboy. I tend to brew in five-gallon ratios, although it's 
reasonable to use a one gallon vessel if you want to experiment or go with the smaller thing based on budget or space or what have you. But I have my five gallons of water and honey and herbs. And whether you add the herbs to the fermenter or not is, you know, there's different thoughts on all of that. I'm not going to go into detail, but. I mean, some people physically leave their plant matter. I will, I tend in to. In the ferment the whole time. That's right. I tend to leave the ginger into the fermenter. Like the root floating inside of it. Then, yeah, it sinks, but it. Um, or it sinks. There's so much flavor in ginger that you might as well put it in the, the fermenter. It's and come out slowly. Yeah, it's a prebiotic it's a probiotic it's all these different things it actually is really i think healthy food wise for the yeast and as well as it creates kind of a home for them to um from what i understand they sort of cultivate the surfaces of the ginger and so i actually think it's really good for um the the yeast i tend to almost always incorporate ginger into my mead recipes just because it's a lot safer um De- flavor wise and development developmentally your mead will develop better with a little bit of ginger in that meads i've made without ginger it's hit or miss as to whether it comes out the way i want it or what have you like it it provides from my experience a lot of bass mm-hmm. if you can think about music as being bass and treble and then you think about taking a sip from this mead we have here in front of us it's there's a lot of body to it in your mouth the mouth feel has this body that's a really dynamic and full body and a lot of that is attributed to the roots and in this case ginger so generally you filter out the herbs before you put it in the carboy and start fermenting it but certain things like ginger you like to leave in yeah i would say with that question i wouldn't say generally because i'm all over the board and how i make things and it just depends on where I'm feeling with what particular herbs I'm using. There's certainly herbs that I don't want to put into the fermenter, like um, mint. <laughs> yeah, ba- things in the mint family, they tend to get a little bit um, okay. wacky. Um, nettles is another example of something that if you do a good steep with a lot of nettles, you can get what you want out of the nettles filter into, out and, and then, then filter that out and leave that out. But... Um, Flowers. I love making meads with flowers. And so roses, for example, I tend to add that into the honey and then um, stir that in with the honey so they're not exposed to like extreme heat, but just a mild heat. And then I'll filter something like that out um, because they're they're, the possibility of them. There's a big difference between um, fermentation and putrefaction. Yeah. And like some things will go putrid really easily. And um, rose flowers, the fleshy petals is a really good example of something that can get a little bit funky in the fermenter. But ginger can withstand a little bit of... It's tough. It's a little bit tougher than a rose petal. Yeah. Ginger will... And it's interesting because after several weeks when you go to rack that, so then after the fermentation process, we siphon the, the wort, the brew, off of whatever's there the dead yeast and the ginger for example and when you taste that ginger there's absolutely no flavor left in it at all when you taste the actual root of the ginger Uh when you pull it out of the mixture it's just pulp and it doesn't have any flavor and so and when you taste it going in there's still a lot of flavor left in a ginger that's boiled for 45 minutes but after several weeks of fermentation there's no flavor left in there what about fruit because i've definitely experimented with using berries and fruit and leaving it in during the brewing process and I've had different things happen but I'm just curious what you think about leaving fruit in so to answer that question I will um, just back up and make sure that we were clear that we have the the honey and the water and the tea and the herbs whether you leave the herbs in or take them out that's all going into a primary fermenter you add the yeast to it and you ferment that for however many weeks. And again, we could probably do a whole podcast just on which types of yeast, wild yeast or well, packaged before yeast. Before we we'll... talk about fruit, tell me what kind of yeast do you prefer to use? And So I, I, I tend to use a packaged yeast and mm-hmm. that um, there's a lot of people that are into the wild fermentation and using wild yeast, whether that's through adding grape leaves or the grape skins themselves that contain a wild yeast that's... 
honey water that captures yeast, right? Or honey water that captures yeast. And so for our listeners that are maybe new to the whole concept of fermentation, the yeast is really the agent of transformation that converts the honey into alcohol. And so yeast is a single-celled organism. It's a type of um, mushroom, if I'm correct, and it is available everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's just floating in the air all over the place. We don't even see it. It's just present. And so if you take honey and water and leave that out exposed, it will begin to ferment. Eventually you will have some form of alcohol. Which is perhaps but, where meat came from in the first place. Yeah, there's a, there's a strong um, contingency of folks that say that that meat is the oldest alcohol in the world, historically speaking. Because honey would be in growing in a tree because of bees, and then there would have been rain that got into the tree, and then, you know, traditional peoples would have come upon that and sampled it and said, well, this feels good. <laughs> and that eventually they, you know, in other words, nature can make mead yeah, by you itself. put the honeycomb in a clay vessel and then it rains in it and then you have mead. And then you have mead. So the idea that there are these wild yeasts that are ready to cultivate your um, your honey in, into a, a beverage called mead is certainly out there. And there's a lot of people that, that go down that avenue of working with wild yeasts. And that's a whole category inside of the craft mead culture. The cult of, like, yeast that you would buy in a store have been kind of handpicked because of their characteristics over time by people. And that's why I choose them. You know, for me, I, I spend, let's say, $50. I think right now we're currently getting honey at $41 a gallon when we buy five gallons at a time. And that's local honey that's made from blackberry. And so I don't really want to roll the dice on that. I want to make sure that what I'm going to be getting as my final product is um, somewhat what I desired or what I set out to get my goal um, in the first place. And so I'll use any number of strains of yeast that I can buy from my local brew shop. And now I'm not using bread yeast, folks. <laughs> Just, you know, I know a lot of people back in the day, we made this mistake of well, it's just yeast, right? And so I had friends and people that would go out and oh. use bread yeast. Wow. And it, it's that's not what we're talking about. We're going to the brew shop and we're buying specific yeast strains that, that are with honey. that work with or grapes. Um, there's again, you can use a, a yeast created for a white to create a white wine, and that the wine industry has developed this yeast. It's not through um, a lot of the brands out there are not gen contain no genetically modified organisms, despite a lot of people's worries that, well, store bought yeast contains GMOs. That's no longer the case. The ones that um, we're finding in our in our brew shop industry is they're typically GMO free and they're um, just strains that people have worked with for hundreds of years. Well, what are some of your favorites of what you? I like the D forty seven yeast that's made by a. Um, a group called um, Lavlin. Mm -hmm. They could be a that. sponsor for the for the podcast. <laughs> and we should contact them. Um, Lavlin D forty seven is a good one. Lavlin makes a couple other ones. I um, EC one one zero eight oh. I don't know. They're all numbers, folks. They're it's a strange system that they have for how they organize their different strains. Uh, when I first got started, we were using um, a, the brand was called Red Star, mm -hmm. and then theirs was it was a champagne yeast, and that Use was that. the one that we were using almost exclusively. It makes pretty dry mead. Too. It makes really dry mead, almost too dry from from my palate. It just it goes up to such a high percentage of alcohol that it would take anything that was sugar related and converted into alcohol and it left it with this very what i call hot flavor you know like a, a it just it had like a a, a a heat to it that almost kind of burnt your mouth because it was and it wasn't the ginger necessarily the alcohol that was it was too strong and so 
at one point, um, I met a brewer who um, recommended the D47 as a yeast that showcased varietals of the honey, um, the floral notes in the honey. In other words, I had been in Hawaii and I had picked up a bunch of honey there. It was Kauai, um, honey from Kauai, and it had a very pineapple-y flavor to it. And I wanted to make a mead with that. Um, and knowing that the, the champagne yeast was just going to obliterate any flavor there, um, this mead maker recommended that I use D47. And so that's when, that's the first time that I had experienced that. And I really liked the outcome. And I stick to that one. I, I play with other yeasts, but it's really hard to determine in the end. There's so many other variables and factors what the which yeast really does what. I'm not that type of scientist and I don't want to be and so I But you consider it still like when you want the honey to shine, you think about that. Yeah. I mean, I think I've fallen into a little bit of a groove with this particular strain of yeast and that I I just like that one. And so that's the one that I typically work with. There's Montrachets and there's um a whole list. If you go and get yeast catalogs, you can find a bunch of different things. And I encourage the listeners to to branch out and find different um yeast strains that are out there and play with them and uh you know keep notes in your journals and write down which ones you worked with and which ones and try to figure it out. Some of them have um degree uh temperature spectrums and so you can sometimes find ones that are more uh, cool preferable or ones that prefer more heat so depending upon like the temperature zone that you're brewing in if you've got it if you're storing in your in your garage or your kitchen or whatever like you can work with um the yeasts based on what temperatures they they go for but then the other variable that you see in the catalogs is what percentage of alcohol they work themselves out to because drier is more alcohol drier is more alcohol and um I mean, it it works out that way, but it's not specifically that because you can use more honey and then um, ferment it out to a certain degree and have it still be a sweeter mead, but it can still be a higher grade of alcohol if you use more honey. And so it's a strange kind of math that goes into... It's alchemy, too. You can just yeah, call it that. and Yeah, the play. The, all of those things. Yeah, there's a dynamic to it, and that's a little too nerdy to go into on this podcast, but you can... You can manipulate the variables and, and, and have a specific outcome if you're focused and work with those particular variables. The amount of honey used and the amount of the kind of yeast and what percentage of alcohol it will go up to. In other words, you can use a set variable, like I say, a gallon of honey, but if you use a yeast that will only ferment up to, say, 12%, it's going to leave a lot of residual sugars that will give it a sweeter flavor. Whereas if you use a um, champagne yeast, that will just gobble up all that honey and create a drier yeah. product and in the end. more alcohol and less of the sweet sugars left. Right. But again, this is the science. This is not what people are listening to this podcast for. They're going to go to a book for that kind of information. Well, the idea is once you have the tea and the honey and you have it in the carboy, which is the glass fermenter, like mm-hmm. I said, I use a five gallon fermenter and you've added the yeast to that. Then you put an airlock on top of that, which is just a little thing that has a little bit of water in it. And it's a little plastic configuration that keeps 
the yeast that's floating around in the air outside of the vessel from getting into the fermenter. So air can go out but not come in. And there's a couple different versions of those airlocks, right? Yeah, there's two different varieties that basically work the same, but they ultimately are meant to keep errant yeast or yeast you don't want from getting into contact with what you're fermenting. And there's no way to really skirt around that if you want a specific thing, right? Like I, you can't just put a piece of mesh fabric over it with a rubber band. And Again, like, if you're doing the wild fermentation style that involves yeast that's just airborne wild yeast, then yeah, there's you know ways that you can not have to use an airlock. But I even recommend once you know that the wild yeast has made contact with the ferment that you then use an airlock throughout the, the latter part of the fermentation. But that's kind of an aside. What we're talking about is pitching the yeast and having what's called a hermetically sealed vessel. In other words, it's cut off from the outside world. It's sealed. And so the airlock is letting the um, off gas from the fermentation pro process to leave the vessel. Are you in the camp of making sure everything is super sterilized too as you do this? I would recommend that um, to people who are just getting into this. In other words, having used a, um, an agent to sterilize the interior of the, of the carboy and the airlock and so forth. But for the most part, when you add the yeast to it, it's going to be so strong that any kind of if you didn't, often I won't sanitize my carboys in the very beginning because I know that the yeast that I'm going to use is pretty strong and it's going to ultimately um, cultivate to the to the yeast that I'm using. They're going to outwit any errant yeast that are generally considered to be of a weaker stature or whatever. But yeah, it doesn't hurt to sterilize the components, especially when it comes to bottling and so forth. Once you have a finished product, that's when I like to really make sure that everything that I'm working with is sterilized and clean because the introduction of, um, at that point, what you're concerned about is a bacteria of the type th that makes vinegar. And so it's really easy. F the, the biggest error that you can make in mead making really is introducing a, a vinegar bacteria into your finished product and winding up with vinegar, mm -hmm. which isn't really the goal. But it isn't necessarily a bad outcome. It's just not. It's not what necessarily you want. a bad outcome. I'm sure there's a, a bourgeois market for um, honey based local vinegars. Yeah. But um, I think we're going to be happier with our finished product of a mead. Yeah. So thus far, we have made the tea, or you could just use honey and water, but you make a tea and then you generally take the plant matter out unless you maybe are using specific things like ginger or berries, maybe, depending on what it is, or fruits, but taking stuff out and then putting it all in a carboy with an airlock so that the yeast can eat the sugars and release mm -hmm. its oxygen without anything coming in. And that's, that's right. where we're at at this point. And so we could call that the primary fermentation, right? So that's the first stage of the fermentation process, which maybe could take two months or three months or four months or five. It just depends on temperatures and what you're... How, ultimately what kind of time you have because when it comes to bottling it after a few months when it's done fermenting um, it's going to really be a for, for me anyway it's about oh do I have a spare few hours to go through the process of the bottling so sometimes I have things that sit in the secondary fermentation for several months and they're maybe ready to bottle but I just need to get around to it mm -hmm. so second ferment, secondary fermentation could be defined as the moment that you siphon, or what's called racking, the mead from the first vessel that you initially put it in. So maybe the ginger and some of the herbs are still in that vessel. And then you siphon it into a second glass, five-gallon vessel. And that at that point would be called the secondary fermentation. And it would sit in there for another few weeks or a month Depending. So the, the primary fermentation could last. My gauge is once I start to see dead yeast forming at the bottom of the, the fermenter, that's when I like to rack. So that in the 
primary often fermentation really, that could be a few weeks. It's of, often really bubbling and like active and then it slows down and, that, and then the yeast builds up. And mm-hmm. you're like, okay, it's time. Yeah. To In other words, I don't have a sound science around this. I'm not going to tell your listeners that it's after two weeks, do this, or after three weeks or a month, do this. It really has to do with just watching what's happening and getting a feeling for it. And again, having the time to say like, okay, tonight when I get home, I'm going to go rack that mead and put it into the secondary fermenter. And then again, it sits in the secondary fermenter for a few weeks or a month or more. And you start to see that sediment building up at the very bottom of it. It's called trub. And that's basically dead yeast. And that dead yeast, if it sits on it for too long, it can impart a certain flavor that to me is a little bit like mm, cheese or the other version is the um, gym socks flavor. (laughs) There's two different ones that you can detect in a mead that sat too long on its yeast. And there's the cheese and the gym socks. And you don't want either of those. So you rack that out. But I've also heard that's pretty nutritious and people use that yeast. Sure. Yeah. I, I like to eat it, you know. And there's a whole um, trub muffin crew of people back in Asheville that like to bake muffins <laughs> with it. And I think they wrote a song about it. <laughs> um, trub muffin. But yeah, the yeast is ultimately like nutritional yeast or baker's yeast or brewer's yeast that people add to food. Um, in a benefit kind of way. So if you can figure out how to incorporate um, yeast into your cooking, all, you know, props to you. I often just drink it, you know, like it's like a byproduct of the the racking night or the bottling night when you have the pure stuff that you've siphoned over and you're left with, um, you know, half a quart or a quart, depending on um, how mu- how well you racked it. In other words, you lose a little bit every time you do the racking. So you start with five gallons. Sometimes by the time you bottle, you're bottling four gallons or four and a half gallons. And so there's a sort of a loss that takes place. And so any way to recoup your loss, um, you know, it's always good. Drink it up. Drink (laughs) a trub. Are you of the camp too? These are things I'm thinking of because it's been a while since I've made a meat. But I hear some people say that you need to fill it as high as you can. When you first ferment it and like that's good for it, like to have less oxygen touching the liquid, but then by the end of the process, it seems like the, the liquid goes down enough that it's pretty open to the air. But then again, the air is only going one way, right? I've definitely heard that like have the carboy, which again is the glass fermenter, the five mm-hmm. gallon or three gallon, They're just, they come in different sizes, but the carboy um, should be as full as possible at all yeah. times is the rule add water to it that I've always heard. I wouldn't add water to it. Don't dilute it once you've got it going um, because, well, you don't want to dilute it. But I also feel like that idea of having it as full as possible is a little bit of a urban myth, mm-hmm. urban legend or whatever they call that, in the sense that um, if your airlock is on there and it's on tight, you shouldn't have too much trouble in terms of like that – having what's called a lot of head in in airspace is called head and having too much airspace uh, is supposedly mm, exposing the the surface area of the mead to these extraneous forces. I think that's more of a beer making issue because beer makers are coming out with a lower gravity, a lower percentage of alcohol. It's called gravity. And so the... Um, they're working with, let's say, 4%, 5%, nowadays 7% potential um, of alcohol. And so they're, they're way more susceptible to bad things happening. But with the mead, the alcohol level is often 11%, 12%, 14%, 16%. And if you're working with higher levels of alcohol, you have less to worry about. And so that whole concept of like, oh no, there's too much airspace... Um, isn't as much of an issue, but I still, as a, as someone who is, mm, want to control as much of the variables as I can, because if you let one little thing slide, you don't know. So I try to keep them as full as possible. And that goes with the racking is just trying to get as much from one vessel to the other vessel. One is for that purpose of sanitary, not having a whole lot of extra airspace, but also I don't want to, I want to end up with as much pure finished product as I can. 
So the second degree ferment, we were talking earlier a little bit about fruits and I asked you a question about whether you leave fruits in or not. And so you were saying when we were on, not on the record that you often add fruits during that time and leave it right. in. And so that's kind of why we've spent the past however many minutes describing the fermentation process in order to be able to um, talk about secondary fermentation with, with having enough facts or information involved to understand what secondary fermentation is. And so once I've racked it off the primary and the major aspects of fermentation have gone um, gone there, they've done their thing. And so that little air, that little airlock bubbles when it's letting the air off. And once that airlock is bubbling less, like in other words, kind of not at all. And you know that for the most part, you've gone through the fermentation process and what you have in the vessel is something around 10, 11, 12, 13% alcohol. That's when I add my fruit. And you don't do that for every mead, but certain meads. Certain meads. So let's use blueberries as an example. Because we used to go up on Sam's Knob there in North Carolina and harvest copious quantities of blueberries. And then we would make these blueberry meads. And in the beginning, we were just throwing them in the beginning or we were just playing around with them. But what I found out worked the best in the long run was adding it to the secondary fermentation or the final stage. And... That has to do with when it's vigorously fermenting, it's off-gassing all of these, uh, the byproduct of the fermentation. And if the berries are in at that stage, you're losing a lot of the um, uh, subtle flavors of the berries, right? So they have a very um, f almost floral flavor. The, the, the chemical analysis of the fruit contains these really subtle, I'm forgetting the names of these things. Somebody out there knows and they can type it into the comment section below, but it's um, a fruit ester. And so these fruit esters are evaporating with the fermentation process and you're losing that blueberry flavor. And what I was finding when I was making blueberry mead early on, again, we were using this champagne yeast and so we were just annihilating any of the sugars that the blueberries were offering. But with that, we were losing a lot of those fruit esters. And so we we're losing a lot of that kind of classic blueberry flavor. And what I started to find was that by essentially soaking the blueberries in the wine product, the final, you know, fermentation stage, um, often that would kick the yeast back in and they would still do their work and start to bubble again. But the goal would be to not have it bubble so vigorously that you lose a lot of that flavor. And so sometimes I would add, like, let's say, like I was making this blackberry mead last year and I harvested all these beautiful, big, giant, fat blackberries. I froze them in one gallon Ziploc bags. I started the mead, which was this honey and ginger. Around the same time I harvested the blackberries. And then after a month or so, I pulled the blackberries out of the freezer and let them thaw. And then I put them into um, a fermenter and I siphoned or racked the, the ginger mead onto those berries. And I let that sit for a week and then I bottled that. I've made the mistake I mentioned to you, mentioned it to you off um, the mic, but that I did a bunch of blackberry mead one time and a big, pretty big vat of it. And I uh, just put as many blackberries into it as I could the first round. And um, the thing blew its lid mm -hmm. several times and we had blackberry seed pulp on the ceiling of our outdoor kitchen. Yeah, it'll, it'll, um, <laughs> it was it'll geyser. Dangerous. Yeah, it can, it can, it's amazing how much force can be brought up through that fermentation. We, we were in outdoor kitchen, so it was like, oh, this is kind of hilarious, and like, okay, we gotta clean this, there's flies, gnats, okay. Mm -hmm. But then I just ended up doing a thing where I kind of altered my airlock to be like a tube when going into a glass of water that mm -hmm. then went off gas, but then I didn't realize at the time that I could have done it this way instead. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, these are the tricks of the trade. And I really, um, I learned quite a bit about the secondary fermentation through a book called, um, 
Yeah, oh, just... is it the guy in Kentucky who's written about the Viking guy? Right? No, it's. Me, but... I think it's called um, Nazi an introductory to mead making or something. It's a. It's a the complete mead makers. Guy. Don't quote me, folks. That we'll look this up afterwards. Maybe we'll put, put it in, in the. I'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. It it's a really great book, and yeah. it's um, it's you know, uh, it's it's thorough, but not expensive. It's not like yeah. a, a really expensive manual to acquire, and it's available at most brew shops. From my experience, I see it often, and it's kind of I think it's like a go to mead makers. Um, com- I think it's the complete mead maker's book or something i forget his name but he's got a nice section on secondary fermentation which he really kind of breaks the process down and he's um speaking from experience he definitely writes from his own um mistakes and uh ad- advantages and so he's he's got a good book shall and, we drink a little bit more before we move to the next oh sure what do you want to try this um we have two different we have two here. different ones let's go with this one this uh, this here is a is actually an interesting Scotchburg. example of um, varietals. In other words, I mentioned earlier that there's different names for different meads that depending on their ingredients. And this one contains barley, and so it's actually a braggot, b r a g g o t, and so it's a mixture of barley or malt, like you would make with beer, um, with honey. But I also used a local invasive plant, so we could use that as a talking point if you'd like, of using scotch broom, um, the flowers and the tips of scotch broom to make a scotch broom braggot. Cool. Yeah, scotch broom is definitely a plant in this area that people try to get rid of as much as possible, even though it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it often is found on old mining sites. <laughs> It's pretty invasive and there's a lot of it. And it's kind of like one of these things where I feel like if people had a use for invasive plants. Well, it's a great natural dye and it's a nitrogen fixer, but it definitely, you know, it's its own thing. A lot of things. And if there's people out there that have information about um, Scotch Broom or, you know, Scotch Broom brews, I know there's a, a. quite a bit of people experimenting with Scotch Broom as a, as a brewing additive. Hmm. Um, then, you know, fill in on the notes below because I don't know a ton about it. I've researched it slightly. It's in the pea family. It's in the legume family. And so it's a, you know, and there's a interesting in that regard. And there's a species, subspecies. There's like not just scotch broom, but there's other little brooms in California that have mm-hmm. taken over certain areas that are also invasive and I don't know right. all the different names. And this one's extremely invasive. I mean, you will see whole hillside things areas that are just covered in this well, each pod pea pod will release tons and tons of tons seeds and, and tons like if it's not in check i could just i could see how it could take over like it seems like it is really interesting in terms of northern california invasive species this was made in 2015 and so it's 2018 when we're recording so this is um it'll be three years old in say june awesome. i don't know, have Really interesting tasting too. It was very sweet and thick when it has its, all these complex syrupy flavors. almost when I first bottled it, and people didn't find it terribly palated, palating. I don't know. I liked it, but some people it didn't strike their fancy. I thought this would be a nice one to set aside for a few years and see how it matures. It reminds so, me a little bit of a medicinal cough syrup. And like an herbal based cough syrup like it has a, it's not sounds great doesn't it no, folks like in a good way like but <laughs> but cherry like there's like but there's nothing right. cherry really in that but like there's some well it's slightly sweet out. and it's yeah. somewhat bitter um but not in a um astringent kind of way yeah um I could see how this wouldn't be some people's cup of tea like and it. to me I do like it too it tastes similar to what it tasted in the past, but less um, thick, less viscous, less syrupy than it did at, at first. Like those, some of the um, the body of it has thinned out. I find that in time, you know, through the aging process, like things tend to get quote unquote thinner is my experience. Something that in the beginning might have a sort of a lot of, and I guess they're residual sugars that give it that sort of syrupy feeling, but that the bottle 
for bottle aging tends to allow that to calm down somewhat. So maybe we can move into that. So after the secondary ferment, you don't mm -hmm. do any other racking after that usually, right? You don't do it So I may it. rack two or three times. Okay. Um, again, it depends on how much sediment's building. And really the idea is, there's an old phrase I learned early on, and that was ferment until clear, bottle for a year. And so there was the idea that you would ferment the product out until it was clear. You could see in, look in the carboy and you can see your hand on the other side. And again, it's still dark in color maybe, but it's transparent, translucent. I don't know. It doesn't have a lot of milkiness to it. It's like a beer. It's clear, you know. I guess nowadays they make a lot of these hazy beers. There's all different kinds of things. I don't know what the best example for this is, but, mm, you know, clear. It looks, it's thinner. It doesn't, it's not opaque, yeah. right? So then you bottle that. And I like to bottle in wine bottles. People use different things, but um, I place them in wine bottles and cork that and then set them aside. And I'm pretty good at aging, like letting them set for a period, but I also have like, a, enough of a stash that it's easy to let it sit for lengths of time. Because you have other older stuff you can pull from. Yeah. Share or like. But I'm not necessarily going to go on record as saying that a mead should sit for a year. I feel like that's um, maybe the perspective of the people that are wanting to do it perfect and submit their product to the Miser Cup and win, a, you know, blue ribbon on this thing and it's got to be a year old at least or something I find that they're often really enjoyable in the first few weeks after the bottling and so um, I'm once I bottle and put a cork on it I tend to want to sit on it but often I'll put a few into those lock top bottles hmm, and then I'll just yeah, yeah I'll just enjoy those as things go or I'll bring it to a potluck or share it with friends or something like that I like them when they're new you know one of my favorite meads was one that eric the person i was dating the past five years uh, made last year two years ago he made a lavender mead that he put lavender in the first ferment and the second secondary mm -hmm. ferment he when he wrapped it he strained it the first chunk of lavender out and then he added fresh mm -hmm. lavender again nice and then when we wrapped it it was just like so amazing right away and then of course some of it sat and it was really hard to not drink it mm -hmm. before a year it was so good it was so flavorful mm -hmm. and lavender i mean there's so many varieties of lavender and some of them are better for would that be better thing. for things like yeah this. subtle but flavors it's just yeah that one and the idea of adding fresh lavender i mean in california you kind of are are surrounded by um, like Mediterranean herbs that are in abundance, so you can kind of play around with using tons mm -hmm. of rosemary or lavender, but mm -hmm. it's not as precious as it would be in a place like North Carolina, but like in the fresh quantities, yeah, that it was just so great right away that I just wanted to drink it all the time, but yeah. So one other thing that we could just throw in in terms of bottling and so forth is this idea of what's called priming, and that's adding a little bit of sugar during the bottling process um, in order to... Sugar or honey? Well, I just mean... Something sweet. Something sweet. I yeah. use honey, but yes. Um, adding some extra sugar in order to give it a little bit of bubble. And so if you were to add some honey to a bottle and then cork it, and then let it sit for um, a week, a few weeks, a month, then that honey will go back into fermentation, so long as there's a, some yeast to eat it. And then the byproduct of that is um, these bubbles that are really nice to where when you pop that cork, it's kind of like champagne, it's called effervescent, right? So you pour that into a a glass and then you get the little bubbles climbing up the side and of, they the, do that with kombucha of the glass. They make it a little bubbly as well and, and similar. Mm -hmm. process. Right, similar process of bottling it before it's completely done. And so you, sometimes if you bottle a mead early, you might 
not need to add honey because there might be a little residual sugar that will do that self priming. It'll bottle ferment but then a little bit. How do you bit. know how to not add too much? Honey? It's all really tricky, and I think um, you know to your to the listeners, I would recommend that you talk to people with experience and um, learn a little bit of the ins and outs of priming because I won't go into detail here, but it basically has to do with making sure that your fermentation is done, that there's not any leftover sugar. And that can be done using a hydrometer, which is a little tool you buy from the heart, the brew store. And it's, um, it's just a little thing that tells you how much sugar you're starting with and how much sugar you're finishing with. It's a hydrometer. It's a very simple tool, really handy, um, but it involves a little bit of math and science. But if you know that you're at 0% potential alcohol and then you add a little more sugar into the bottling and then cap it, so long as it's just a little and it's not being exposed to too much warmth or mm, variable conditions like cars that are dry, you know, and getting <laughs> shook up. and In other words, it's risky, folks. But my experience is that you can gently add just a little bit of sugar to it and often get the the desired effect of the when you pop it, it fizzes. But the the thing to be aware of is that if you do it wrong, you could have some explosions. In your you could have color. bottles that blow up, and when one blows up, often others blow up with it, and that can make a mess. Um, you can have the experience when you go to open the bottle that suddenly it's <laughs> blowing up out of the bottle the and geysering. A, yeah, and it's kind of doing that champagne thing that they do in the movies that, <laughs> for whatever reason, looks like a lot of fun. But it's a bummer when you're camping and that bottle of mead is the mead that you're going to share around the campfire and suddenly <laughs> you're passing around this fizzing, geysering, frothing mead that everybody's just trying to take it down brother you know and just it's a it's a very dramatic effect and it can be a lot of fun also (laughs) if it can be you can take your eye out you know (laughs) i don't know i i like that but i tend um i tend to just do a few bottles and i usually use the lock top because they tend to be stronger bottles and they're a little easier to manipulate the opening and you can kind of reseal it with the lock top whereas with the um, wine bottles and a cork um, I tend to not prime those. I don't add any more sugar to those. I just let them ride. But I like them smooth and dry as well. But there, there's stuff, absolutely there's something to say about the nice effervescent, uh, bubbling, beautiful mead. That's kind of my favorite. Yeah, I like the bubbles too. In a way, but maybe we should keep those rare. You know, like just do a few per batch, and yeah, if they're kind of special that way, I guess. Mm-hmm. You can always post carbonate it like some people do too. Like the mm-hmm. ginger mead we had earlier. Yes. And Quaylen was attempting to carbonate after the fact. Right. That's a whole other thing. but. Right. And so for the listeners, you know, that's a, like um, this concept of like forced carbonating where you would put the mead into um, a keg or like a pony keg, this small, like those soda kegs, and then use. Um, a carbonation tank to to force carbonate, which I'm not against. I'm all for that. But now you have your meat in a keg. You could, from that point, transfer it to a bottle and, and cap it With off, and it would still it would still retain that carbonation effect. Um, is my sense. I haven't experimented much with that, but um, that just. It's just a technical thing that I think for a lot of the people listening, there's probably a few people out there that would really enjoy going into that level of science. It's kind of the neat thing about the whole mead game, if you will, is that there's there's a whole spectrum. I mean, you can do it as hands-off as you want. I mean, you could make it in a crock with a, a Muslim, bag, Muslim bag over it and then drink it as you go or put it in the bottles. Or you could go the other spectrum and get super technical yeah. and measure every little aspect of what you're doing, like weigh out all the ingredients. In between, like in I'm kind of in between two. I like to I like to keep track of the ingredients when I write down in my in my log what I'm working with. I like to mark down how many ounces of ginger I used or how many 
grams of rose petals. Recreated later too. And then that way, if I find that I like really got a really nice thing, I can recreate that. I've never recreated something that I made. <laughs> so I still do it out of just, a, I guess, a sense of posterity. But I don't really, I, I feel like every time I make meat is a new opportunity to make something different. And I think that that's part of the beauty of the mead movement is that we're not trying to necessarily nail something down and make it recreatable. You know, I mean, that's the whole idea of like the commercialization of, of the craft beer movement is, well, it's got to taste the same every time. Every batch of this, you know, hazy IPA has got to taste the same because that's what our clientele want and so forth. And well, my experience of what we as, as makers and connoisseurs of this alternative movement is that we're open to it being different. We're open to changing. Our work, or like the seasons, everything, every year is different. Spring arrives at a different date and winter, right? You know, it's just that you are working yeah. with the land. I may the make nature. the mead on February 13th every year, but some years it's going to be a full moon. Some years it's going to be a waxing moon. I mean, what the effect of the moon on mead making? I'm not saying that that's a thing. Could be. But it's like what you're saying is that like change is the only constant. Yeah. And so, which leads us to this other mead here, which is um, a mead that I make every year on my birthday. It's September 19th. And the plant that happens to be in abundance um, in my neck of the woods is goldenrod. And so... Um, here in the Sierra Foothills? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tend to go a little higher up in elevation. Right, right. Um, the higher Sierras have... But been. even this, I mean, this... I feel like I just haven't seen a lot of goldenrod in the mm -hmm. lower foothills. There's, there's patches. They're, they're not around. Not like I've seen an Appalachia. Not Appalachia. like an Appalachia. And this recipe, I mean, I recipe, but I first started making this mead in Asheville area. Um, and goldenrod was just... Everywhere. Prolific. Well, it's just so interesting that you've carried that tradition of the fall and goldenrod from Appalachia to your home that you've had the past eight years in the Sierra Foothills of yeah. using this. It's a different species of goldenrod. Yeah. And it grows in a different way. Yeah. But that you're also making it here. And I'm really curious if you have a bottle from back then. And now oh, right. We could pair of those. <laughs> well, and again, was the moon full on that one and new on this one? You know, well, like, again, that, all these variables change. That cross um, ecological species speciation thing i don't know mm -hmm. like i'm always really interested in i mean i like to look at plants from like this horizontal thing too where like oh like how can we relate to each, to each other by the fact that we have shared plants in our eco regions and so the idea that you're making meat from this plant that you've gained a relationship to in another place here it kind of mm -hmm. connects you here in a different way than it might. And it blooms out. right around my birthday. And so there's this aspect yeah. of like my birthday gatherings have tended to revolve around um, creating this goldenrod and um, ginger mead. And whether that was like with friends or by myself, it just became like a, a yearly tribute to the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this particular one, I mean, this was from the Jones Bar and the Bitney springs roads area and so that's at our elevation which is about 2,000 feet in the past in years past i've gone to higher elevations um up around bowman lake road uh and um the bear river meadows and so forth to harvest because it's pretty prolific up there but this year um i found a couple nice little patches and like i said you, you you'd miss them if you're not looking for them but when um i got to them they were pretty big patches and I found um, ample quantity and this particular year we brewed it and it went through fermentation at my friends um, Chris and Dre and the Penstock Meadery drink your medicine <laughs> folks that um, Dre's just a big um, aficionado of the fermentation and the mead making and so she um, took care of this one because I was uh, traveling a bit, not really um, stationary enough to maintain holding so no this one. That I'm, the excuses I'm making that I don't have a place to put my music. It was kind of, yeah, it doubles back to what I was saying about brew it, like make it and they will come or whatever. Like the people will come out to take care of the meads. And I was going to use this one as an example of that 
story actually because sure enough it was taken care of and it was it stationed itself at a friend of mine's house like i said the penstock meadery drink your medicine is their motto and um this is a good one it's a um goldenrod and ginger mead made on wow. september 19th of oh, wow, 2018 And so this has been bottled just for about, I want to say a month, month and a half. Um, and so... Because you started it, this is from this year. Yes, and this year you, being um, September 19th, 919 of 2018. And we're in 2019 now. Mm -hmm. And so it's been less than six months. You've fermented it, bottled it, and fresh bottle mm -hmm. open from within right. the last year. It, I, what I'm noticing about this, there's, you know, the Aster family it contains plants like Echinacea and Sochan, which mm -hmm. is a plant in Appalachia. Green-headed cone flower. Which is a native greens, wild foods that people like to eat there. And mm -hmm. Echinacea and Sochan are really interrelated. But for whatever reason, this goldenrod had, reminds me of Sochan. I hear you. It tastes like the leaves. <laughs> yeah. When you use the leaves of Sochan as a pot herb, it has a sort of astringent bite to it. And this one's giving off that bite, along with the um, the kind of classic goldenrod. Yeah, but it feels stronger than the goldenrod I use. This is just me geeking out right now, and like I and, don't know what the names of any of these constituents right. constituents are off the top of my head right now. But but you you can tell it's an aster family mm -hmm. plant, and that in this area when you have these dry summers, and I think about how plants like act differently mm -hmm. when you don't have a lot of rain. I just think that maybe this goldenrod might have more medicine. I don't know. Yeah, the volatile medicine. oils. I mean, I had a teacher once, Dennis Klocek, that said something to me. I was studying alchemy with him, and he was saying something to the effect of a medicinal property in a plant is directly related to the stress of that plant. Like, in order for a plant to create a medicinal quality, it needs to go through a type of stressing out. And that's what gives it those oils and those, those flavors that we're attracted to in terms of like, whether it's flavor or medicinal content, it's coming from the plant trying to keep caterpillars off of it or keep, you know, it's gone through heat or through drought or through something that's forcing the plant into a type of stress Condition now that stress may happen to it every single year, but that plant is going into a, a type of oh no, I've got to make seeds or something like that. And it really hit home with me living in um, the Sierra foothills these past years because it is so dry here. And like come August, it's that much flowering, it's August. intense to connect to these plants. Like you mentioned lavender earlier, rosemary, or the yerba santa, or all these different plants that we have these relationships with that have such potent volatile oils, which is so different than my experience in North Carolina, where it feels more dispersed and diluted. But there's so much abundance, and there's abundance in the medicine. Waves of things that come about and then fall out and come about and fall right. through. It's a whole different kind of it's like an ocean of waves. vocabulary yeah. or ecos. It's a different um, sort of brew, if you yeah. will. And and my experience here connecting with plants, especially from the perspective of doing distillations with plants, I have a, a an, an alembic. It's a copper still that I can use to make hydrosols with. And I find out here whether it's the Kit Kadizzi or as I mentioned the Yerba Santa or um, the rosemary and lavenders and these really dry loving plants that have really high oil content are really um, flavorful. They have a very strong aroma and it's different than what I experience in other places in terms of like how strong those flavors are when I go into the distillation. Yeah. And so I think that what you're saying with this Goldenrod is an interesting example of like, was it just such a crazy dry year? And we harvested this probably on, on the 19th of September. So mid to late September, there had been no rain. 
at, um, all. at all, all summer. Um, and so these plants had concentrated these oils. Sure, I wonder. I don't think we used any of the leaves. Um, I think that we had really stripped it down to just the flowers. And so um, I could see how, like your example with the Soshan, like it, like that leafy flavor has a really chewing on a golden rod leaf can be very astringent and kind of bitter in that regard. But I don't think this had that in there. But your task will be to try this GRG nine one nine mead <laughs> here and there over the next year or two, yeah. and try to harken back to this night when you tried this, and if you can different. remember this flavor. Watch how it changes and watch how the bottle aging affects it in the long run and gives, you know, does, does that mellow out that astringent flavor that you're tasting? Does that kind of become more amicable in terms of, you know, right now, I don't know what you could pair this with, but the goal would be able to be able, you know, you could pair it with some ice cream in, in the long run, maybe a little vanilla, a scoop of vanilla and a little side of this, and it might be a nice combination because we've got this really bright goldenrod ginger flavor but it's right now it has a slightly medicinal feeling yeah to it. it's i was just thinking that like you can consider it a bitters or like just straight up medicine drink like to me it doesn't quite have like you know it doesn't have alchemides like i'm not feeling that echinacea like watery like mm -hmm. ma like tingling thing mm -hmm. or anything like that but it's just like it feels like medicinal in some form I yeah know. i don't even know how but you know, goldenrod has specific medicinal qualities, but yeah, it's pretty cool. But yeah, you were saying about the fullness of meads in the beginning and how they change and fade, and yeah, I'd be curious. So how it goes? How many bottles of this do you have? Um, about a case and a half. Which is like twelve, fifteen bottles, mm -hmm. wine bottles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 15 or 16 of these. And, you know, they can, um, they can go fast. I'm pretty good at sitting on them. Yeah. But that's just me. Like I, like I said, I have a large enough stash. And, and I tend to want to um, share them with people. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's like few and far between that someone will come along that will fully understand what it, you know, what it is. And so it's... It's not likely that I that I generally share like say this one this birthday mead. I'm saving some bottles for like mead circles that I hope to attend at some point in the mm -hmm. future, and I can pull this crazy bottle out and be like, okay. Do you want to tell your listeners about um, the mead circles? Well, I mean, I have probably haven't been to as many as you have, but. I know in Asheville the way that we've done mead circles, and this is something that I mean I've taught I travel a lot and don't feel like I've found this anywhere else, honestly, in this way, to the extensiveness that I found in Western North Carolina, of this process where your whole community is engaging in mead making in some form, whether there's someone making like one batch a year to someone who's making batches like this, like every five, 10 times a year at monumental occasions, or people making their the sacra mental or the second mm -hmm. sacramels sacramels <laughs> like someone's birthday or some special full moon or like something and every big community event that happens there tends to be a mead circle by default it's kind of like just understood that's going to happen and anyone who's attending not everyone who attends is necessarily bringing a mead but i would say like half the people who attend these bring a mead they made at some point in time or five or five or ten. <laughs> and then this process starts where it could last anywhere from an hour to 10 hours of people passing around whatever they made and sometimes it's really this interesting thing and everyone starts to get kind of in this other realm because there's so many herbs and so many little elements to these means that like creates this communal kind of state of altered consciousness but also sometimes in those big mead circles which could end up being like a hundred people there might be some crazy things you don't know that are in the means that's happened too or someone might put some psychedelic thing in there too or like a certain plant like i think mark williams has 
done some record keeping of some of these mead circles. And I can't remember if it's yarrow or some other plant where, like, noticing how it affects people, too. Mm -hmm. like, well, yarrow <laughs> contains thugens, which is a particular type of, huh. um, you know, chemi chemistry within the plant. And thugens are the, um, the same components that are found in wormwood. And so oh, that's the, you know, active ingredient in uh, absinthe, yes. <laughs> the Artemisia family, and yarrow also contains these same thugens. That is what I think Stephen Buhner would call highly inebriating. And a lot of plants do this, and some of them, it's simply by um, speeding the heart rate up. And so you're pushing the alcohol to the brain much quicker than normal you know rosemary i think if used in high quantities in a beer or a mead will do this thing with your heart rate where it actually um, gets you drunk faster and that can be alarming to people if they're suddenly fine and then the next thing they know they're a little tipsy and it, it feels you know different and so yes these mead circles certainly um, can be subjective to uh, the experience of people uh, losing their bodies, if you will. But my experience is that um, there's so many meads and they're being sipped on in such this light quantity that um, I haven't seen too much out-of-handedness, although there's probably plenty of stories of um, shenanigans that come along with it. But my experience is that they became these really... Um, sweet circles of people singing and people Magic, sharing yeah. and people just winding up in a big cuddle puddle or just amazing sweet things and or storytelling storytelling Suddenly all night around the fire yeah just really amazing um, gatherings of people and I think that you're absolutely right that I mean I, I can remember sitting at a a mead circle one time at some place not to be named that I just looked out across the whole crowd and the whole environment and the the music playing in the distance and just thinking i don't think there's anywhere in the world that that a sharing of homemade beverages on this scale uh, takes place and i was just really um taken aback by how beautiful of a of a gathering it really is and so i i think that's a testament again to this mead movement as being really homegrown really organically oriented um w the goal is to work with the purest ingredients no one's sourcing honey from you know uh chemical or distant regions it's local honey it's local plants it's all wild crafted and made with love and then shared Although, with love in sanders katz's book what the art of fermentation which you were a contributor to there were some really interesting contributions from people who made dumpster meat and stuff like that. Do you remember that? <laughs> I don't think I, I picked up on that. Um, I read it because I knew some of those people. Like, sure. And Sander Katz was like, yeah, I'll put that recipe in there. Where people basically like dumpstered a bunch of watermelon or something and they made dumpster watermelon meat. You know, but like, isn't that out of love? You know, I would still call that <laughs> local if it was locally dumpster. You know, I don't know. You know, the idea, I mean, I, th I think we all know what dumpster diving is. It's when you salvage um, things that are still good. Food out of, expired. right, that are being thrown out or what have you. And um, I mean, that first meat that we had was, uh, was a donation that someone yeah. had received. It was all in sealed bottles, it was, but it was juice concentrates that were being uh, shifted out of the, the market stream. And there was cases of them that were being, that were given to me. And so I, I think that, um, making mead out of expired fruits, vegetables, or juices is a perfect use of those things. You know, like as long as it's done with, um, safety in mind, then by all means, you know, and the process of fermentation might even, purify yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something rotten i wouldn't use rotten things i mean it's I mean, no, back to pickling you those, yeah people are using rotten watermelon they're using good watermelon that 
Just we should edit it. that part out of there. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> we are not condoning use of rotten watermelons, folks. No, yeah, I don't think, I mean, it wouldn't work in the first place. It's just that it's interesting to think about. Not you know, everyone can just wildcraft because they don't necessarily know what to wildcraft. So the idea that you use what is around you, even if you had a garden and like you had too many cantaloupes or too many of things. I mean, I've seen people juice sweet potatoes and like use that to make meats. It's just like whatever you have in an abundance. Well, as a transition, I'll tell you that fermenting <laughs> watermelons barely works anyway. Really? <laughs> I don't know. And I... Um, I think there'll probably be a lot of people that will have their opinions about it, but I've played around with fermenting um, watermelons and even um, uh, pumpkins and things like that. Yeah. They're really sketchy. Like it's, it, you gotta really be on. You gotta be more careful with those. Yeah. One time I took a watermelon and I drilled a hole in it and I, um, I mashed it up inside the hole. So inside the, the rind, I kind of, mashed up the the pulp inside and i add a little bit of honey and some yeast and i put an airlock on the watermelon on the watermelon <laughs> and how did it turn out um most people at the potluck didn't like it um but sandor cats loved it and so <laughs> you know to each their own i guess yeah it's all subjective it's all subjective <laughs> So you were, yes, you were a contributor to Xander Katz's book, The Art of Fermentation, that most people know in the mainstream. What part of that did you write? Like, it was just a little section on um, on a page regarding yeast. Yeah. Um, and uh, he had written um, the book Wild Fermentation that was... This, uh, More of a, like a prequel to that, or a zine compared to that. Well, I wouldn't call it that. I mean, it was a proper book, but it was really like a... Um, a tome to the wild fermentation, the, the idea of, um, exposing, um, the, in this case, mead to the wild elements and letting it be cultivated by those wild, uh, yeasts. And so then he reached out to me to contribute to that book in the, in the context of what would you, what could you say about using, um, domestic yeast. Mm -hmm. In other words, the yeast that come from the store in the little packets. And so I wrote a little blurb for that mm -hmm. bit. And you, you were, had your computer open earlier because you have basically like a, I don't know how many years exactly you've been fermenting. What do you, yeah, I guess we're saying meat. 2004. And you've been might recording have been every single thing that you've made since. Mm -hmm. in a document or several documents that have transformed over time from yeah different in, in ingredient lists and you know locations as to where it was made and all that it's nice to have a little book that you keep i haven't done that something before. written down <laughs> about what you're doing or what you're making and you know you write down the date and you write down the the ingredients and uh you know what um what sign the moon is in so <laughs> If you're, if you're a good hippie, you know, the phase waxing moon in Gemini, blah, blah, blah. No, I don't know. You so just... what's the purpose of doing this for you if you're not necessarily going to recreate any of those? Like, why keep this record? In case the label goes bad and I can't remember what's in it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, I just, I think, you know, some of us make lists for the grocery store and some of us make lists of, yeah. you know, I mean, the, I, I make lists. I feel like every year I set out to plant my garden and I try to write down like what's where and what's this and that, you know, and then I make it a few weeks or a month into that process. And then that book just winds up in the greenhouse, um, faded beyond ability to, to read it, but read it. somehow documenting it. I don't know. I just enjoy that yeah. aspect of it all. I mean, why Mark Williams documents? The meat circles are brilliant. When I travel, I document the plants wherever I camp, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And I don't know why, but there's some reason over time why it will make sense, you know. I think that's what I, I would say. I mean, it's like, I mean, you use the example of Mark Williams, you know, it's like, are we trying to recreate that meat circle? No. Are we trying to, like, we just want to know what was there and what 
we're, we're not going to, I don't think we use that information very often, although there has been but books written and things. But over time that will reveal something like the fact that people use Yaro the most or something like yeah, absolutely. Well, why are people drawn to that in this place and time during this era? Like, if you really think about it from 50 years from now, like, what will that, all that, just taking the time to collect that information mm -hmm. mean, you know? Mm -hmm. No, I think all that, I mean, I guess it would say, like, it's for posterity, you know? I, I think the, the information that's gathered from these mead circles is super valuable, you know? Like, I think the phrase that gets thrown around is cultural topsoil, you know? Like, each... Each some of these bottles contain multiple labels from all the different uh, meads that have been in them, and sometimes oh, from right they're like heirloom bottles. They're like heirloom bottles, and I have some bottles that I pass back and forth from a friend. Like I know that every time they gave me this bottle, and then it's got their label on it, and then I drink it, and then I fill it up, and I put another label on top of their label, and I give it back to them, and then we have this sort of like a uh, pen pal relationship with that trading these bottles back and forth and um the collecting the data on the circles i think is hugely important in, in gauge of that cultural topsoil and again not to lose the fact that what we're talking about is bottled culture that yeah. these yeasts that are in the bottled place in there are the culture that themselves i mean that that the word ferment you know like it could also apply to a crowd a riot you know it's the crowd was fermenting over you know some political unrest or something like that i think we're at a very unique time culturally you know like as a as a people and that everything that we're doing should be um if not written down at least observed with a clear mind you know, clear eyes that are watching what we're a part of. And if if part of this is reclaiming a tradition that's thousands of years old. Cross-culturally, too. Cross-culturally. I mean, all over the world, Making people have brewed too. and created fermented beverages with their local plants, which for thousands of years, the plants were believed to be allies and understood as peers in each other's lives right so this this um goldenrod may be my totem plant or something and and having it in this conversation tonight is bestowing magical powers of communication right i'm um not being face facetious but i'm i'm making a point which is to say that we are engaging in a type of mythology that's thousands of years old that involves plants and fermented beverages but it's not necessarily like copying that it's like being intuitive about it where you are i think it's place. about reawakening yeah you know i think it was in um the 1500s that the um the german purity act was enacted and that said that the only plant that could be used at beer making was hops. And so that because it's an, it's an suggests <laughs> on its own that prior to that, there was probably hundreds of plants that were used in beer making. And so did every family, did every village have their own cultural recipe for what they brewed? You know, did people have their own totem plants? And if you went over to, you know, Sky Turtle's house, you had goldenrod beer. Because that's, you know, the way he rolled. And, and what's that all about? And why was that restricted? And like you mentioned, like that was, it had estrogen qualities to it. It had, it was a, sed it was a sedative. It would, it chilled people I out. I mean, at least what I've read, and maybe it was in Stephen Buter's book, The Sacred Beers book, about the estrogenic quality of hops, which is in the cannab cannabinaceae family, same as marijuana, right? Mm -hmm. It has... You know, it's interesting that it's such a popular plant used in beer, which is so popular among male identified bodied people or whatever, but it's an estrogenic plant and that's what culturally was, I mean, in an era where like people drank, drank beer in fermented beverages before they drank water, suddenly the church or like the powers that be felt that they needed to influence 
the use that the people, the commons used, the plants that the commons used in their main beverage because there was a certain, they recognized that there was a certain influence that the diversity of plants that people use, which possibly altered consciousness or created a sense of freeness and Dionysian qualities, they didn't want that. Yeah, there. well, there's a couple interesting variables that I understand go into this equation, and you mentioned the church, and... The institutional church. The institutional church, and then the institution itself, the authority, the king of Bavaria. And the two variables, and they ultimately lead to conspiracy theories, if you will, but they're probably not theories, they're probably just conspiracies, and that is that um, the church had holdings on all the hops. They, um, through the uh, monks and through the monasteries, were growing the bulk of the hops in Europe. And so it was sort of a business issue. Um, and then there was the fact that the effect of hops is as a natural sedative. And that it chills people out versus, like you said, these other Dionysian plants. You know, what were the Artemisians doing to people? What were um, the yarrow? The groot was one of the famous beverages of that era and was made out of, I don't know, 15 to 45 different plants. But it was causing people to, I think, have a very freeform relationship with Pachamama, with Gaia, with the earth, with each other, and with great spirit. And that was potentially a threat to the establishment. And, you know, I'm not going to go any further than that because I'm, I'm not, not really all... Of, well, <laughs> because I'm not trying to be about conspiracy theories. I'm not but trying I to mean, be about looking back... Making your own booch, which what we're doing yeah. is not legal, is kind of... Like, this is legal. <laughs> isn't it i don't know actually i'm legal. pretty sure it's legal folks i don't think that at this point the um the german purity act is trying yeah. to enforce well, our we ingredients i don't really know we're not actually. selling it we're making this for our own homes about the fact that we can make our own it's not booch i would call moonshine right. booch but which is way higher alcohol content. But just the thing. idea of fermenting your own beverage that you drink, that's your medicine. I mean, even making your own tinctures, technically, it's like this weird radical act that it shouldn't mm -hmm. be. But to, to make, create your own ferments that you drank and you are altered by is well, like a radical act. And it makes maybe me what think we're, about this history that we're... Maybe what to. we're su suggesting is that it's fun to be a heretic. That... If we ultimately are uh, um, enjoying the fruits of our labor and we're doing it consciously and responsibly within the confines of our own three-dimensional space, then, you know, what is the problem? And that's the issue that I've always had with that purity act and with the idea of outlawing certain ingredients that are otherwise, you can make a soup out of whatever you want, but as soon as you ferment it into beer it's illegal you know like that that idea of that law that was a major blackout of thousands of years of tradition and i think that that's ultimately being turned over on its own head and that we're the progenitors of this new direction of um plant magic if you will plant medicine whatever you want to call it but we're reopening uh, the medicine chest of the alchemist and the witches. And there's really nothing wrong with that. And it's something that we need to cherish and enjoy and encourage each other to do. And also to do it responsibly, because I want to be really clear in this broadcast that there are plants that will hurt you if used inappropriately. You know, whether it's henbane or jimson weed or uh psilocybin mushrooms you know like i mean there are some things that don't belong and with that i will say folks if you get into the the act of of brewing mead and using various herbs be really conscious about 
what plants are contraindicated for pregnancy. There's a lot of plants that don't need to be um, involved in in um, a pregnant woman's diet. I guess alcohol shouldn't be probably anyway. Although I, I think that 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 struck to know alcohol when it comes to pregnancy is kind of a little bit of a Judeo Christian mindset as well. It really is, and I think that there's a place for mead in a in a pregnancy, but I think that. Probably it, it would be to um, really inform people to be informed about what plants yeah. work and don't work in pregnancies and whether you're the, the brewer or especially the pregnant person, be really conscious of, of the idea that these, that these can actually be poisons. Yeah, totally. I just want to say that or as just... a disclaimer. And then we can move I'm back into being heretics. <laughs> <laughs> like ginger and black cohosh mead, maybe not what you want to drink in eight months. But yeah, <laughs> I bet James. I bet this um this uh, Scotch broom is probably not such a good one for a lot of people. Seems like it's in the legume family. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it would be something that you would want to drink. Like huge quantities i don't think so i can and again i i love the idea that the comment section could be a place where people that are listening to this that do have information i posted on the blog and there's definitely like space for comments because i'm really interested in the conversation yeah around this because people have different perspectives on plants and specific places and yeah and on fermenting yeah i've researched the scotch broom um, as an ingredient in, in beverages and quite a bit of stuff comes up uh, and it's it's a little bit hit and miss. A lot of them are just blogs, people that I, I felt like were contributing to the, the culture of brewing but didn't have a whole lot of information on the plant well, itself. Well, it's just like what do you really know other than what you experience? I mean, there's, there's the scientific mm. research and then there's your own experience over time. So if a collective of people experiment on themselves... But there's also probably a tradition around this plant somewhere, you know, that yeah. there's something that we come up with through that process. Yeah. Well, hopefully some people will contribute some information. I mean, I feel, feel fine from drinking it, but it's definitely intense. It's definitely like very specific. I don't know. It's got a unique buzz to it. Yeah, totally. I think. It's, it's very unique. And the legume family is one of those families that it's either really edible or poisonous. That's what I'm saying. Different members are either edible or poisonous. It's not like some families, like the mint family, that's pretty generally edible or medicinal, mm-hmm. with like pretty much no exceptions except for pennyroyal or whatever. But it's still fine, kind of mostly. So the lagoon family is kind of like mm, I don't know, maybe mm-hmm. it could be fine or like powerful or maybe a little poisonous but we'll yeah. see you know well let's just use this thread as like a like to reinstate that this idea of like folks do your research and be yeah. really clear about what you're working with and there's obviously a lot of books out there that you can find guidance from highly recommend Stephen Buner's book Brewing Sacred and Herbal Healing Beers and then there's Dale Pendel's Three volume books. The Pharmacopoeia trilogy. Mm-hmm. That's a great book in that it covers the the plants that are typically associated with the um, altered states and the what he calls the poisonous path. Yeah. Um, for example, I've made a lot of coca leaf meads, and that book has a great section on coca leaves and one of the earliest. Western uses of coca leaf was um, as a, 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 a champagne, a coca leaf champagne that was used for, to treat headaches. Whoa. And so, you know, when you do a lot of research around this subject of fermented plant beverages, you often find a lot of medicines. And that's interesting that the root word for mead and for medicine come from the same word, you know, the same concept. And so what we are talking about on this podcast is ultimately making our own medicine. I'm just thinking another intuitive thing about this. I mean, we right now my my glass has a mix of the goldenrod and the mm. scotch, scotch broom in it, but I'm 
Remembering this fall, I went on a plant walk with Doug Elliott, whom I'm sure you know, mm-hmm. uh, in South Carolina when I showed up at the rendezvous when I was visiting the South, my family there. And there were black locust pods on the ground. And we, during the plant walk, opened up the black locust pods and sucked out the pulp in them. And black locust is in the pea family. It's a tree from the South in the pea mm-hmm. family. And that pulp inside that you can get out of the pods, which is edible, that's almost like a sherbet persimmon flavor. I'm suddenly tasting weirdly mm. in the scotch broom mead. Just, mm-hmm. you know, I'm like, that's what I'm being reminded of right now. Mm-hmm. This, the pulpy black locust pod. Which is a common plant that people use in meat making, the flowers anyways. And there's yeah. black locusts here in the Sierra foothills too. Yeah. Or a locust that might not be the exact same species. But to get geeky about that kind of thing, it's just like the flavor is reminding me of that. But I don't know. Well, you know, that's what we do when we drink meat. I want to um, use that as a segue into the difference between the um, imbibing of beer or wine or whiskey or tequila or champagne or gin or they all have a different spirit to them is my been in my experience or my observation. And what I have found with mead specifically is that time and time again, the, the circle, the group of people that are sharing in the libation tend to fall into a, a very philosophical or studious or maybe it's just the people I hang out with. I don't know. But <laughs> there tends to, it, it, it drifts into these. By uh, where I'm going with this right now, I'm getting a little philosophical about it. But that's just also who I am. It's who we are. <laughs> but it's also, I feel the, um, it's, this isn't the kind of vibe one carries after drinking a few bottles of beer. It's yeah. just been my observation. Again, it's back to the hops and the quality that comes from a sedative or whatever. I'm not saying anything negative about beer per se. I'm not saying that um, whiskey makes you know people one way or the other, but there tends to be like different moods and energies that come with this. And uh, I've, I've observed that the, the mead tends to... There's a reason why it was called the the beverage of the poets or whatever they called it. I don't recall. It had to do with the idea that the bards of, of old um, would, would drink their meads and play their instruments and tell their stories. And there was a very um, theatrical energy that comes with the spirit, I think, that's invoked in the, the mead itself. And I think that's a very real thing. I don't think there's a lot of hard data on this kind of stuff, but there seems to me to be an energy uh, that goes along with uh, with these these plant based uh, beverages, yeah, that to me is more interesting than all the rest. I mean, I think brew culture, it seems there seems to be an up, up uprising right now of like the brewery culture, which is tends to be beer with hops, but maybe outlying um, formulas for like things that. People are experimenting in that realm, but when you really think about it in the long term historical pers- from a long term historical perspective, yeah, there's so much more that could be expanded upon in that realm, and I think it's exciting that people are doing that. And at the same time, seeing like places like Asheville and Portland, Oregon, become really like inundated with breweries on this mainstream level, mm-hmm. they're all like the same. I'm kind of like, hey, yeah, I was just thinking about that the other day, now. like. Let's Are there... really, like, be radical here. Like, we're going to all be, like, inebriated. If we're going to... If that's going to be normalized, we might as well, like, try to, like... I don't know. Integrate the place more. I don't know. Well, I think it's about lifting the vibe. And that's, I think, what the... The homebrew craft scene has always been about. Yeah. In general. You know? And I think that for for everyone listening, if you... If you just pursue this, this art, um, you will a find that you have some really nice um, things to sip and share, 
and that B, you'll have this sense of being part of a really neat movement that is national, international, global at this point. You know, it's like really grown. And I'm talking about the mead movement. I wonder about the home beer makers. I just meet less and less people that well, seem to offer me a home brewed beer. I mean, beer. it's like the mainstream brewery. I think it's taken over. Movement like that's happening. I think that the the mainstream craft beer culture has gotten so big at this point that it's left a lot of the people like, you know, your cousin or your uncle that like got a home beer kit for Christmas 10 years ago and was like making their own beer and enjoying that. I don't meet that many people that are doing that anymore. And I think it's because it's just, it's like you can't keep up with all of the, like there's so many small breweries out there now that I don't know. I think that there's this sort of like, ah, well, I'm not as good as them kind of thing. Like, I don't know what it is. Do you agree with me? There's, does it seem audience listening? Is there less beer, like home beer makers? Like, I don't see that as much anymore. At the same time, some of those spaces feel like I'm always interested in the, in the, where we create spaces to get together and talk. And whether that's a coffee shop or whether that's a park or whether that's a trail in town or whether that's a brewery or whether that's an, I don't know, like where are the places we get together in public spaces or semi-public private spaces or what are we engaging in? Drinking tea? Are we drinking a mead together? Are we drinking a beer together? Are we walking and looking at Yarrow together? Where are these spaces that we're creating that we get together in? in this modern capitalistic patriarchal whatever the hell culture that we live in like and it's interesting to me that breweries are becoming like a really big thing because in some ways i see what you're saying in other ways i'm like and i see how it's negatively affecting certain places like i think there's enough breweries in Asheville. like stop enough like and they're mostly owned by men and i'm like come on now like i don't know that's another thing but i'm like i see that negative in that but I also see that it's interesting that that's what we're leaning into a little bit towards spaces to coexist in and like what is that really reflecting in our culture right now is it some is are we are we trying to ignore reality or are we really diving into reality like to something with each other by like wanting to hang out in these spaces together I don't know and that we're accepting it as more normal Especially places like Asheville, it's south, you know, like, there's, it's a pretty conservative area, but then you can go to Asheville, you can drink as much beer in as many different places as you want, and, you know, it's fine to talk about all the crazy things you want to talk about while you're drinking beer, and some of them are pretty radical, I think in that place, because of what we talked about as the brew culture of that of Western North Carolina, I think has set the stage for that to be possible in that place, and not as much as in other places. But what is happening there? The good, the pros and cons. I don't know. Well, I'd rather do it on a log, sitting around a campfire in my backyard totally. with a bottle of mead, rather than in a city in a weird cement cement building with like this capitalized thing being presented to you to commune with. Yeah. Totally. So I guess what we're saying is take it all back into your own hands, folks. You know, like that's what the Mead movement is ultimately uh, presenting you with is the opportunity to uh, make it your own and to reclaim a heritage of your own creative process involving a relationship with plants, bees, honey weather the calendar and the stars and so it's is it is alchemy and it is uh, a very real and easy thing to engage in and so whatever direction you find yourself going with it i say go at it full force you know pedal to the metal and just make the things that you feel inspired to and then share them with your friends Will you give a little context for, like, maybe... At, at what point, I don't know, is the appropriate time to talk about the history of mead and fermenting in general, but, like, a lot of people don't realize that mead 
and other various related forms of fermenting have been a part of human, like being human for so long. Like, you know, it's at many points in this podcast, I'm like, when is that something we interject into this? Like, to reiterate the idea that this is something that's a part of being human. Like, do you have anything to say about that? Um, I don't know. It's, you know, the book I've been working on, it's called, um, The Diary of a Mead Maker. Like you're writing a book. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I have the, I have the, the structure of it worked out in such that it's sort of these three parts and, and one part is, um, the diary of a fictitious mead maker who is located in, um, the the northern European culture, the Scandinavian peoples, and he inherits the role of village mead maker once his grandfather uh, passes away, who was the previous shaman, if you will. You know, and through that, I'm I feel like I'm channeling a bunch of ideas and coming and distilling these various concepts of of the cultural um, role of the brewer. I'm not a cultural anthropologist, not an anthropologist, not even an anthroposophist, as far as I can tell. So I don't know enough about that to really, you know, say on on tape what what the role of this, this is in, in human history. I'm not, I'm not, I guess I'm not I asking f- you to be the authority, but just like, what is your little slice of right. thought about it, you know? Well, I'm a Virgo, and so it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard sometimes to, on the record, say I mean, things and not necessarily say that I know anything about it, well, but like, I feel like it's old. We've talked about it somewhat, that like, the... The relationship, I mean, of course, Sandra Katz's book with the art of fermentation really goes in depth with this kind of thing. Like, all the different traditions of fermenting mm-hmm. around the world. And, and Stephen Buhner's book, even it. deeper. Which one? Stephen Buhner's book. And Stephen Buhner's. Mm-hmm. But basically just reiter- reiterating the idea that fermenting things is part of being human, but also fermenting things with sugar, various sugars, is also part mm-hmm. of being human, like... And for us to just, like, reevaluate our idea of, like, our relationship with these products that mm-hmm. come out of that. To try to separate our idea, ourselves from the idea of what Christianity has imposed on that, too. Like, that being, that drinking is bad. I mean, of course, drinking to excess can be bad for you. But, like, I think I got that from Stephen Buhner's book, too, like that maybe engaging in that process is sacred. Yeah, because it's been a part of being human, which is just really wild and fascinating because, but there's so many things in our culture that we've come up with. Like I just did an interview with someone on high tanning. What a crazy alchemical process that how the heck did people figure that out? You know, same with me making. Mm Mm-hmm. How the heck did people think to take this honey from the hive and put it in a vat and, like, make it happen? Like, it's crazy that we've come to where we are right now from that, you know? And that it's something that happened in Scandinavia and parts of Africa and, yeah, Asia, you know, that people had different traditions around mead or mead-like things. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's synonymous with the traditions around the drum and around the dance and around the ceremonial aspect of what it means to be human. And so these are all tools, the drum, the dance, the mead, that carry the participants over the threshold into the spirit world. And so the practitioners of the, of those tools was the shaman. And so in all of these traditions, it's different names for shamans, but ultimately there were people that were the caretakers of the cultural traditions. Yeah. And many, many, many cultures had alcohol as the, the tool 
that was a part of that experience, along with the drum, along with the dance, along with fasting and ecstatic uh, engagement, along with physical uh, rigor, you know, like staying up for days. Like there was this pushing your bodies to these limits that caused this shift of perception in order for the people to go over that threshold into a state of call it bliss or call it spiritual awareness or call it um, downloading some kind of information that was important for the community for the community for the connection to place for all these other things connections to the plants connections to the mountains connection to the weather connection to all these different things we as modern people we may look at that with a feeling of wanting you know longing for that we may look at that for, as with a feeling of scoffing this well that's just silly that these people thought that that was the case you know like we don't we are in this state of isolation as were those people they felt themselves contained inside of a physical body and sought a way to um step outside of it long enough to remember who and where they were inside of a cultural um, process of self-discovery. And I think that these are what the psychotropic plants and drugs have done for countless cultures. And you and I are operating out of a, um, a you know, waking up from a, 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 a religious takeover of our um, ancestors. You know, like our, our genetics have gone through hundreds of years, countless generations of people who have been under the thumb of an oppressive mentality that steered us toward a very specific belief system and um, find the drum, and find the, the dance, making me a scotch bread. find the... <laughs> Find the mead, find the, the rigorous activity, find the pilgrimages we talked on our, our last meeting about walking for hundreds of miles is hello. That is a way to activate your soul, yourself, your spirit that occupies yourself in that if whatever the tools um, activate them because we are coming quickly to an abrupt halt of our position on this planet. We don't know what's going to happen in the next 15 years, 30 years, generation. You know, will, will our children or grandchildren be able to sit and have this dialogue with us? I don't see why not. And a lot's going to change between now and yeah. then. And it's our job as stewards to uh, re-evoke uh, the things that work. And honestly, plant-based relationships seem to be the thing that got us through 30,000 years. I'm not an anthropologist. <laughs> of uh, of human settlement on this planet. So connect with the plants, folks. If that's if this is the means to that. One of the few means that we can utilize. I mean, what I find so fascinating about fermentation is the creative aspect of it. And like, I've been having a lot of conversations about culture and, like, how we can appropriately navigate finding that connection to the land in our modern times, especially as people from European descent in a place where our ancestors colonized. And it's like, well, fermenting is kind of this cross-cultural thing that sort of just, like, feels very empowering to engage in, you know? Even if it's making sauerkraut, but utilizing wild plants too. Or maybe it's making kombucha, or making mead, or maybe it's making the sizer from like the orchard. Or compost. That we have. <laughs> I love making compost. <laughs> or making compost. That's fermentation. Making compost using your coffee grounds and your leaves from your mm -hmm. fig tree or whatever. You know, like, I mean, this is. So this is a podcast about mead making, but it's so hard to not go into fermentation in general as like a mechanism for like combating the ills of our culture. <laughs> I mean, that is the overarching theme of it, the bigger picture.
but it's... I apply this kind of like mercurial God to fermentation. In other words, in the old world, mercury was the God of transformation, of communication, of all these different things. And so looking at fermentation as being a process that mercury oversees, then we're looking at transformation. We're looking at changing something. First it was this way, and now it's this way. With cabbage, it's, I don't know about you, but I don't really do well eating raw cabbage. If yeah. you chopped up, I mean, even like coleslaw or something like that, it makes me feel bloated and gassy. I just don't like it. But as soon as I put it through this process of fermentation, adding salt and letting it go several weeks, merc the mercurial shifting and transitioning of that substance turns it into something that suddenly the nutrients are more available to my body than they were before. To me, there's almost a sort of Christ-like energy to that. You know, it's like first Christ was this way and then Christ was put into a tomb for three days and then Christ came out and it's more available in its message to the world. I don't know what your particular feelings on mythology of Christianity is, but when I look at it as like this beautiful mythology of like a, a, of a, of a light that came to teach the world about something, be it peace or brotherly love or, you know, walking on water, it's like there's a feeling of the transition that took place through a kind of cultural shift, a, a, fermentation, uh, mercurial transformation, yeah. alchemy. Like these are these, it just comes up again and again in the myths and the teachings of our cultural um, epochs dating back thousands of years. Fermentation seems to be this um, element that I gravitate toward. Again, as an alchemist, as a person who's working with turning things from one thing to another, I just groove on the on the ideas mythologically that that they represent. And I think that again, as we bring this as a form of we started with herbalism and how to like um, uh, preserve plants from one season to another as like a reason to make meat. And then we went into like, well, it's fun to be a heretic. And then now we're into the like it has a metaphor for a spiritual transformation of a culture from one thing to another. I mean, I'm, I'm reaching for the stars here, but suggesting that by creating our own uh, shamanic relationship to these types of beverages could heal the faults inside of our own culture, inside of our families, inside of our communities, inside of our own selves. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, Time will tell. We'll see what it's all about.
it's interesting to think about alcoholism and the relationship to modern human, like that modern humans have to alcohol addiction and abuse too, because alcohol is just a byproduct of this process that has come in so many forms. And then it's just wild. I mean, so many things we abuse like marijuana or someone might be a tobacco smoker or whatever television opiates which are come from plants like it's just that i mean this goes into that poison path mm-hmm. realm that we've touched in a little bit or ruffles too. addictive but just that we <laughs> dabbling in the poison world if we aren't right in ourselves as a culture we can easily slip into it becoming an escape yeah we're by no means and that's a disclaimer saying that alcohol is a good thing yeah and um, all things in moderation, including moderation, as kind of one of the paths. You know, this is, again, this this concept that Dale Pendo and his books put out as the poisonous path. Um, cultures have, have often gravitated toward these um, little deaths, you know, like it's a little, it, it's a little death, this thing, this tobacco or this coca leaves or these things are bringing us in a shamanic way closer to spirit but this is a letting go of the ego in little incremental ways yeah unfortunately there's not a lot of training out there in the world regarding this kind of a thing and so we're ultimately let loose into a world um with you know um a starbucks cup in one hand and an iphone in the other hand and we're just left alone for hours to addict ourselves to both of those things. In other words, I think that iPhones are probably the most addictive thing on, on the planet right now. Um, Versus alcohol. Well, I guess there's probably, I mean, <laughs> heroin's pretty addictive. But I just, I'm just saying that, that in yeah. the culture we live in, um, you know, no one bats an eye at, at how much time is spent by people on on a a device and that you know this will time will tell we we will see in another 10 years or more what what that's actually like for people who children who grow up in this world who have don't know the world without that thing it is interesting i don't know what to say about it really other than you know here in herein lies the work that we as practitioners of of culture because we all are have to work on and to look at and to find within ourselves a balance with all these things you know be it the screen or the the coffee or the the mead that find your balance with that well there's a lot less scotch brooms on this planet because we made this (laughs) you know just cleaning up the planet one one scotch, but one bottle at a one that, bottle at a time. I would have worn my scotch broom dyed <coughs> scarf mm, mm-hmm. in you because I have a yeah. linen scarf. I dyed with it. Well, I'm just trying to bring it back it's around to exciting, but it is cool to think about that I've dyed with it. But yeah, but we can bring it back around to like how we as as permaculturalists can um, activate our relationship with herbalism, whether it's mead making or tincture making or medicine making or scarf making back to the we can make a difference through these types of steps you know and again it's it's you know um a toss in the bucket but i think that it's it's for me it's definitely um inspiring every little project i do that chips away at the um the consumeristic hemorrhaging of our culture you know make it your own make your own mead folks <laughs> so besides the birthday mead and the february grateful dead mead what are there any other really special times of the year that you like to make mead um i do i make a bead on um october 13th um another 13 it's another 13. Yeah, on October 13th of every year, I make a mead that um, is for the heretics. 
it's um, on uh, October, Friday, October 13th. So Friday the 13th of 1307. Um, there was a um, quasi-obscure organization of heretical knights that were rounded up and um, arrested for um, speaking and acting against the Holy Roman Empire. And so I'd like to make a mead in honor of them every year. Do you put anything in specific in that mead? Or do you mix it up? Um, it's pretty specific. Would you like to try it? Actually, have a bottle. Sure. Yeah. Just says Mystic Mine House. Don't even know what I put in. <laughs> 14. To, um, we'll see. So, this is the... October Heretics mm -hmm. Mead. Yeah, so... And it's funny that you asked. I just had it... Um, in the cellar here. And this is a special one. And this is, again, like... Like I said, I try to make certain meads on certain dates, and I've managed to um, make this one for years, uh, again, based on the idea of honoring the heretic in ourselves. You know, there's um, many, many, many people have given their life for one reason or another based on things that they believed in. And I think that these... Um, this order of um, personalities in the 1300s gave their life for what they believed in. And so I use that date as a time to honor all of us that are um, pursuing a different thing. And so in this case, it's brewing herbs against the order of the German Purity Act. So what's in this version of the Let me just meat? finish this glass off here. And then, we'll... <laughs> and then the scotch broom slash uh, goldenrod combo that we've been sipping on the past 30 minutes. <laughs> All right. So this one, um, I almost always use elder, I u always use elderberries. In this heretic meat. Mm -hmm. Which gives it this nice red color. It's got this like really pretty... Blood-like color. Did you make this in North Carolina too? This one was made here in California. But do you make the did oh. you make the heretic mead in um, North Carolina, or was it post? -Camino? I think no, it was because <laughs> I remember being in uh, in Spain on October thirteenth. That symbol reminds me of the Tem Knights Templar. Oh yeah, that would be a um, a great a guess weird. at which organization <laughs> I might be referring to. Because um, I've done the Camino and I. Yeah, they're a part of they're a, a big part of that community. But in two thousand and nine, I was in Spain on the Camino de Santiago on October thirteenth, um, and I remember acknowledging the fact that I was not back home making the mead on that day. So to the heretics. Wow, it's very elder. Elder and wait, there's definitely a root. Ginger. Ginger, but there's an, is there another root? I don't think so. Not in this one. Is there? Hold on. Because you always put ginger in it. Generally, I but use ginger. Some, Not always. Some rose family thing in it. Um, rose petals. Okay. Um, sometimes, um, this particular batch has rose petals in it. Chamomile. Is a, a oh. is sort of a staple of this particular um, blend. I often use a little bit of sage, just because I like the word when it comes to thinking about our um, ancestors that were of the the wise ilk. I think of sages, and so I use a little bit of um, like garden sage. Uh, but pretty much, it's like the staples really are just the um, the elderberry. Ginger, the rose, the um, chamomile. And I don't have the labels, the, the ingredients written on this bottle here, so I'm, I'm not exactly clear on what 
all went into this one, but this is from 2014, so it's four years old. So if we were to kind of reflect upon the idea of um, that aging process, and I think that it's interesting to note that some things age better than other things, and um, the presence of the elderberry, I find that when you get tannins into the mix, and I feel like elderberries contain a certain quantity of some kind of natural tannins or something like that because they tend to age a little more like a red wine. There is like an astringent tannin quality to this. Yeah, it's like a wine. Mm -hmm. Like I can feel that pucker a little bit, that like dry tannic pucker at the end. Like a wine. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily from the elderberries. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, again, like through the the aging process and then like whether or not the sage contributed to that or it's just we're we're not in the realms of um science in the sense of being able to like really i mean some someone could analyze this and have a better sense of what ingredients provided the you know the different types of constituents i'm i'm saying this in in the sense that sometimes you just don't know what makes something yeah work this way or that way you know, like what are the it's okay to not the know. ingredients? I've used dandelion in this before. I don't think this particular batch has dandelion in it, but um, I've played with that. I've played with figs. Being I, I often try to think of kind of you know like what are this sort of like European kind of um, scents when I think when I brew this particular mead. Um, another one that I did at least for 10 years on a regular basis was um, celebrating the day out of time on the Mayan calendar. There's that July 25th is the day that exists between uh, the two different calendars. It's like a day out of time. It doesn't actually exist on the calendar. And so um, for, like I said, 10 years, I think, maybe not that long, seven years, I hosted a um, day out of time party at my house. And I would bottle last year's mead and then brew the, the next year's mead. And then that mead would sit in the carboy for 365 days until the next day out of wow. time party in which I would bottle that one and then start the next this one. This was mainly when you were in North Carolina? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was when I lived at a house that was named the Pirate Ship. And that was the one party every year that I, I only threw one party a year. And it was the day out of time wow. party. And that was an event that um, a lot of people uh, participated in. And it was a really cool time because it was largely fueled by this day of time mead. And after a while, you get a momentum going to where you're like, okay, we're going to open the, you know, two years ago mead. And then now we've got last year's mead. And that was a good time. And, and uh, you, So you still make meads during that well, no, that's July. It's kind of funny because I haven't made a day at a time meet, I think, since I left that wow. that Because you place. don't have that same community here. Yeah, something. I and mean, we've talked about that a lot. But something, you know, different. shifted in, in terms of, of that event. And, um, yeah, the last one was made the year that I left North Carolina. And it was um, handed off. The five-gallon carboy was given off to some... <laughs> Some people and I, I, I can't say I've ever seen it again. I don't, like, know. don't know. What happened it that. might have gotten <laughs> bottled. It may, you know, who knows? It's one of those things. You this haven't is gone the, back and check. This is the cultural topsoil. I may be sitting somewhere and someone may, you know, present Pop me it with. Pop out and be like, so do you remember this? This is the last bottle of that mead that was made on that, that day. Who knows? Yeah. Gifts. It's all gifts. Well, it's hard to end this conversation because there's so much to it and I'm enjoying the, all the little tangents and like uh, interrelated ideas that we've woven into this. But I suppose we should end it or otherwise we're going to drink too much. But <laughs> We may already have. We'll see how it comes yeah, out. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of medicine in all of it too. But Well, it was a great time and yeah. um, I enjoyed both the podcasts that we got to do together yeah. and, um, you know, just looking forward to figuring out what the next one might be. I know. 
one, there's so much, pos there's so many possibilities for sure. And I've been inspired to do that walk that you talked about. I'm like, I should just take, do my own take on it. Yeah. Well, you know, and just as a plug to, to all that, you know, anyone that's listening at this point and wants more of, you know, Kelly's awesome podcast here, I mean, go back to episode, I think it was four and listen to the, the interview on pilgrimage and, um, in that there's a little bit of a, um, a call out to people that would be interested in uh, putting some miles into walking across the state of California yeah. on the trans California pilgrimage, AKA the green path and find out, you know, get in touch with us out here and we'll um, try to structure some days to where we can do, there's more research that needs to be done on creating a um, sea to mountains kind of trail. Um, from Mendocino on the coast to Lake Tahoe. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, long walk, but um, it can be done, you know, a little bit at a time. So yeah. um, get a hold of us and we'll, um, we'll do that and there'll be mead. <laughs> Guaranteed. There's some way to incorporate <laughs> mead in it all, like making a ferment for each section of the hike. Well, we did make a meet on the walk across the California. I don't know if we got into that, but no, there was a small <laughs> gathering that happened at Rutgers Lake where there was a little videography that happened. And part of that was a, we were connecting with a local community and making mead. Is there the, any bottles left of that one? Maybe one. One. Two. <laughs> you know, just again, to, to just lift a toast to Frank Cook as... Um, such an incredible teacher, brother, inspirer of all things herbal, you know, just he really guided so many of us onto this path. Yeah. And I know that this podcast probably exists in large part because of Frank's inspiration Sounds to like you and your life, you know, yeah. and I really appreciate that you've sought out people that in one way or another knew Frank or were touched by Frank. And that's part of what you do here on yeah. your podcast and I well, just want to appreciate that for for what it's worth you know that you've made such a great contribution to the the scene thanks I mean after I did my interview with Jill which I hope works out as we inter as we record this I'm working on my edits for that episode but there was some audio interference so we'll see how it turns out but just that she expanded on what his work was and I didn't really quite realize how extensive it was like his work with place and his explorations of specific places and that's like the kind of thing that I've been doing and I'm like I didn't even really know that he was actually doing that like he was about to go to China and do like a China journals log thing mm -hmm. and like I'm like wait a minute like I don't know I mean of course I'm influenced by him through other people and I don't know if I ever met him. Maybe I did, but I don't remember. But, like, through other people, I've been influenced. Anyways, it's just... It's been interesting. This podcast has had... He's been a part of it in some odd, crazy way that seems synchronistic. But also, um, my own life and, like, what I'm doing feels like carrying on this my version of something. I don't know. Mm-hmm related to what he was doing different but yeah the more i learn about him this ethereal person that you and jill and these mark and these other people are connected to the more i feel really it's like eerie how much i don't know yeah i think <laughs> it's like you know in some ways it's like following in in these footsteps or like recapitulating like an i an ideal that that frank carried and then in other in other ways it's just a this beautiful massive archetype when i yeah. think of frank i think of cocopelli you know like this dancing sort of dreadlocked flute playing um native personal indigenous personality of this this spreading the music spreading the seeds spreading like these interviews that you do are each seeds that are being sown inside of a, a digital um, field of cultural potential. It's pretty wild. It's like the digital soil. 
You know, like you're just do your thing, sister. Like, and you're doing what Frank did. Like he was meeting every ear in the world that he could find that would would lend itself to his voice. And he was sharing a perspective. He wasn't always right. He wasn't necessarily, you know, anything other than just the reflection of our own beliefs of like what we um, craved to turn the world into. I don't know. He was just like the soundboard of like all of our collective imaginations. And I think that this is what your podcast kind of is. It's like you're interviewing different people that have all this input, but it, collectively they're becoming a voice that is a really, a really cool thing that can help guide humanity in, in Coca Pelli's direction. You know, like that's what I think this idea of cultural transformation that we're talking about really is. And that's, that's the magic that Frank embodied was this idea of cultural transformation and that we had to do it from the grassroots from the ground up and that your ground shots title of your you know podcast here is is spot on in regards to just realizing that we're it's it's us that are going to do it it's not it's not a headline that's going to save the world and it's not like i feel like i have the answer or have some specific <laughs> There's nothing to even say. Agenda. It's there's... just like I'm following what feels right and I know that there's so many ways to go about it and that yeah. I have a lot to learn, but I'm just trying to be as authentic as I can in the moment. So whatever it comes to will be what it comes to. <laughs> all good things in all good time. But until then, we won't be drinking Scotch Brim mead mm-hmm. and contemplating the universe. As always. <laughs> well, maybe we should end it at that. Because then right. we could keep going. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Turtle on mead making and fermentation. I really hope you enjoyed it and how in-depth we went into this topic. And I really hope to kind of do that again in the future with some other topics and other folks. And maybe even again in this topic. I wanted to also mention that the extra music in this conversation features a friend of mine, an amazing craftsperson, Miranda Heidler of Wild Bergamot Handcrafts. She lives in Western North Carolina. This past fall, I went to go visit my family in Virginia and I swooped down to the Falling Leaves Rendezvous. It's an earth skills gathering that happens every spring and fall and she was singing some songs and she let me record her and I felt like... These songs and Miranda's music was super fitting for this conversation with Turtle because she has been at many a mead circle uh, over the years and a lot of her songs had been sung (laughs) at the mead circles. The first song Miranda sung is called You've Been a Friend to Me by the Carter Family and the second song Miranda sung is called Like a Songbird That Has Fallen by the Real Time Travelers. You can find Miranda on Etsy under Wild Bergamot Handcrafts. I'll link it in the show notes. She makes amazing things out of buckskin and woven fibers that she often hand spins and hand dyes herself. Her stuff is so well made and beautiful. Thanks again, y'all, for listening. Look forward to the next one. Take care. This episode of the Ground Shots podcast was produced by Opia Creative. Our music is by Mother Marrow. If you'd like to help us continue to make this audio project a reality, consider becoming a monthly supporter on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash obsessionsalt, where we have rewards like entry into patron-only giveaways, additional audio interviews, extra educational content, and much more. You can also share our work and give us a review on iTunes. Visit our website at obsessionsalt.com to see what else we're up to and a log of our episodes when they come out. Check out our show notes for information about how to find us and our guests. Until next time, y'all. Thanks for listening.